Township Committee meeting, uh, we will start uh, by saluting uh, the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States. of America and to the Republic, to the Republic which, stands which stands one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we get started, um, obviously it's been a very difficult week uh, in our community. Uh, we have lost a family member uh, in Musa Fafana. Um, you know, Saturday we had a visual that was just heartfelt and heavy. Over a thousand of uh, residents came out to pay their respects and, and be be in community. Um, you know, our hearts continue to go out to Hawa's mother, Trisha, Vivian, the entire family, and, um, and letting them know that we're all here for them. I want to thank all the rep members of the community have been doing many things for the family. Um, one death is too many. Uh, there's no. There's one death is one too many, um, and we have to understand that gun violence has to end. Um, you know, this committee uh, supports um, laws against gun violence, and and gun violence was, you know, a tragic part of, of what happened uh, last Sunday night. Uh, I do want to announce that uh, the county will be offering a ten thousand dollar reward. Uh, for anyone who comes forth with any information uh, in regards to um, Musafa's death, Musa's death, excuse me. Um, it's, um, it's difficult, you know, that we have to go through this uh, terrible time, but it's also imperative that we do it together as a community. Um, we got to find a way to work together and to be together. Um, some of the words that were spoken on Saturday night were really moving from his friends, uh, from his teachers, you know, people that really uh, knew Musa very well. So um, as a community, we will, re we will recover, we will, um, you know, unify. And I know there's a lot of uh, angst and anxiety out there in regards to, you know, what is transpiring, um, you know, after uh, Musa's death. And we will hear from our chief shortly. But um, we also need plans. We need to find safer places for our our young people to, uh, you know, to, um, to hang out, uh, to gather in, in complete safety. Uh, but these are plans that we need to do together. We can't do it alone. Uh, we need to work together and find safer places and make enhancements in our community. So no, no matter, you know, what end of the day, you know, the bottom line is a tragedy happened and, and life was taken from our family. And with that, I would like to have a, a moment of silence uh, for Musa. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 5, Chapter 231, Public Laws of 1975, this is the state for the record that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the public by posting and maintaining the annual notice of regular meetings on a bulletin board of the municipal building, by mailing the annual notice of regular meetings for 2021 to the news record and Star Ledger in 2020, and by filing said notice in the office of the township clerk. Mr. Adams. Here. Mr. Daffis. Here. Mr. DeLuca. Here. Mr. Lembrick. Here. Mayor McGee. Here. Whereas Chapter 231, Public Laws of 1975, commonly known as the Open Public Meetings Act, requires all meetings of public bodies to be open to the public. And whereas Section 7A provides that the governing body has a discretion to permit, prohibit, or regulate the act of participation of the public at any meeting, and whereas are the governing body to comply with the provision of this act, same time to conduct its business in an orderly and expeditious manner. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Township Committee. Township Maplewood does hereby prohibit, except as set forth in the formal agenda, act of participation in the deliberations of the governing body by the public, except as otherwise described by law, does limit the public to the observation of the actions and discussions 
of the governing body and all its regular and special meetings. Second. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. And thank you, Ms. Ritson. Um, before I start, sorry. Before I uh, start reading through uh, the agenda for this evening, um, I wanted to take a moment uh, and yield the floor to our chief of police, uh, Jimmy Duvall, um, who will provide an updated statement um, in regards to uh, Musa Fafana's case uh, and other information as well. Chief, I yield the floor to you. Thanks, Mayor. I appreciate your time. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Chief. Okay. Um, I asked for this time, Mayor, just because uh, more importantly than anything that's going to be said this evening, I, I, I wanted to address firstly that, that uh, victims of violent crime are, are they, they may become statistics, but they're real people. So where I have provided um, data to you and have discussed in public safety meetings uh, about the safety of our town. Uh, and, and it is a safe and it is a very safe town uh, to live in. This does, does not take into account uh, the feelings uh, about the victims. And I really just can't say enough about that so much that I felt that it was important to talk about that because the statistics mean one thing to uh, to some and it means something to another. And if you are a victim, uh, you just, you are, are a victim and you'll forever be a victim. And, and I felt it was very important to address that. Uh, and, as, and as a police department, I can tell you that victims of, cri of uh, violent crime in our town uh, receive every effort that we can to, uh, to solve that crime and to assist the victims in any way that's possible. Uh, and we we maintain an open line of communication with with all of our victims um, throughout the whole entire process. I also wanted to address that that where maybe uh, as I've provided the data to you, Mayor, um, it doesn't discount the fact that that uh, we had a carjacking in Maplewood Village, and even though it's the first type incident in well over a year, that these things still happen in Maplewood. Uh, um, you cannot protect against everything we do. We do our best and our numbers reflect that. Uh, but it's important to know for, for our residents to know and our victims that we take these cases of, of violence uh, very seriously and, and that we understand their concerns it's very easy for you to say the for me to say the statistics make everything better and and they're just so low. The, the statistics are what they are, and when incidents like this occur, Mayor, we take it very seriously, extremely seriously. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to that case, it is still active. We were reviewing video just earlier uh, today, so I don't want anybody. In, in this carjacking case or in the, the, uh, the, the tragic uh, homicide at Underhill Field to think in any way that, that if there's a little lapse of time that we have forgotten about a mayor, we have not. And, and, you, and you are aware of that. Um, so I can tell you that, that that incident in Maple Village is an active investigation. We are developing leads on, on that case. And, and we hope that we hope that we can bring uh, those individuals uh, to justice as soon as possible. And Mayor, when, when it comes to the, the tragedy at Underhill Field, uh, I want to commend uh, everybody involved in, in the collaborative efforts with regarding this investigation. Uh, it's, it's second to none that I've ever seen. We have been, in, we have been collaborating on a daily basis with you with uh, uh, Dr. Taylor from the Board of Education. We have been collaborating uh, with members of the Board of Education, not only on updating um, 
updating them with information that we can provide them, but also information on safety. Mayor, I can't tell you how many, uh, how many discussions we've had about uh, school security, uh, providing extra um, police presence at certain times and in certain areas, uh, as requested by the Board of Education, having additional manpower in, in certain areas of, of our town uh, to make our residents feel more safe. Uh, this is our priority, Mayor. Uh, as, as you know, uh, these things are happening behind the scenes. I can tell you that, that I had two meetings with the prosecutor's office today. One of them uh, you were involved in and you may expand on a bit. Uh, the information that can be shared is shared and, and certainly uh, the investigation is ongoing. There are Essex County prosecutors, investigators, along with our detectives in the field uh, currently. I actually met with them before I was on this meeting tonight, Mayor. I wanted to uh, encourage them to keep up the, the uh, good work, they're working diligently uh, to, to locate witnesses, to discover evidence. Uh, and I can't say enough, Mayor, that, that uh, hearing you and hearing the Board of Education talk about uh, collaborating with the police to, to, to bring individuals to justice in this tragedy, uh, it's really second to none that I've seen in cases like this, Mayor. And, and I, I'm gonna encourage the public at this time to be patient. We are doing our, we are doing uh, our best with the information that is received. Um, there is no information that is given to us, including uh, a plethora of, of social media posts that we are going through. Uh, we are not discounting anything uh, when it comes to this case, Mayor, and that, that uh, you know, I promise to continue what we've been doing uh, with you to be open and, and uh, transparent to assure you uh, and the prosecutor is, is speaking with, with the victims in, in uh, regards to the victims and the victim's family in regards to this incident. Uh, we don't want anybody, anybody to be forgotten, and we don't want anybody to think that the police department is just uh, moving on. It's, it's active, Mayor, and we're currently working on it right now. Thank you, Chief. Um, I, the public, I just want to say first and foremost that uh, this is personal for me. Um, I knew Musa. I knew uh, the other victim, Charles. His name is Public. They used to be part of our open gym program. So I've interacted with them. And so uh, the chief is right to say that I've been in contact with them every single day, even when he was away for a few days. I was in, uh, in contact with him. We had a meeting uh, this afternoon with the Essex County, Essex County Prosecutor Office and, um, you know, and had a, a good debrief. Um, what I want to say, I want to right now eliminate the false narrative that's uh, out there, uh, especially on social media. They are working. They are doing the job. They are focused on solving this case. They are not dragging the hills because Musa uh, is, was a person of color. That's a false um, and our town is safe. So I wanna say that right now, that uh, our department and uh, the county are working on this case. And when they say active, it is active and it is ongoing. And as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, there's now a $10,000 reward uh, for anyone who can uh, come forth with some information, reach out to Essex County Prosecutor's Office uh, with information and they'll take you through that process. But um, I've spoken uh, with uh, Musa's mother today, and I spoke with her almost every day uh, since Monday last week, and also the relatives. Um, and so there, we have ongoing conversations. Um, so uh, this is um, on the top of my mind, as well as everyone else in the community. But I want to go ahead and, and set, set the record straight uh, that uh, this is an active uh, investigation that it is uh, being worked diligently by the county and by our police officers, uh, that I am fully engaged um, and that no one has uh, given up or slowed down in any capacity whatsoever. 
Um, and again, I, I want to emphasize to give um, how on the family space, if you can, it, it, this, is, um, this is not easy. Uh, and again, as a loved one, um, but I want to also communicate too that our town is safe. Uh, I have a young daughter who uh, walks these streets and uh, goes in our parks and, uh, and uh, interacts in our, in, our, in our downtown SIDS. So uh, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure I, I clarify that as well. Um, obviously, statistically speaking, uh, the chief is right. You know, we have, we're very blessed um, in terms of the standpoint of having uh, a police force that does a great job and, and we, our numbers statistically are low, but obviously it's not about the numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's about the work. And I ask that the community, if you know anything, please step forward. Uh, this is a collaborative effort as well. Um, and we need you um, as well. So, so thank you, Chief, for being here uh, this evening and really setting the record straight. I know there's a lot of rhetoric, if I may say that, and, and noise, especially in social media, uh, about some of, you know, some narratives about there not being enough information and, and uh, there being radio silence. And, and that's far, false, false, false. So thank you, Chief, for that. Um, and uh, we won't hold you because I know you're going to move forward and, and, and keep doing the work for the community. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I will move forward and, and go through our agenda for this evening. Um, first off, uh, we have a, a resolution, um, which is uh, um, a bittersweet resolution, but we'll be recognizing the retirement of our fire chief, Michael Weber. Uh, then we'll move into our public comment on agenda items only, and also that's three minutes. So please be cognizant if you're cut off at three minutes and you haven't, it's three minutes. So please be mindful uh, if you uh, in public comment of your time. Um, our next agenda item is the 2021 municipal budget. Uh, we'll be adopting that this evening. And then we're gonna move into uh, one ordinance that's on final. This particular ordinance is related to um, readopting certain provisions of our ordinance in regards to uh, alternate treatment centers, so cannabis. And then we also have several ordinances uh, that are an introduction. Uh, the first one is related uh, to uh, trees. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Um, our second ordinance is related to our stormwater management. And what we're trying to do is be consistent with DEP, which is the Department of uh, Environmental Protections regulations. And our third and final ordinance on introduction is the amendment of our fees related to our um, community centers, uh, the Woodland and the Birdorf. After that, we will have reports from departments and Mr. Dimes will let us know if we have any reports this evening. And if not, we'll move into our administrative reports. We'll hear from Mr. Dimes, our township administrator. We'll hear from Mr. Desiderio, our township attorney. And we'll hear from Ms. Clerk, uh, Ms. Fritzen, our township clerk. We will next have reports from elected officials. We will first hear from Mr. Daffis. Uh, we will then hear from Mr. Limbrick. After that, we'll hear from Mr. DeLuca, and then we'll hear from Ms. Adams. Tonight, we have four discussion items. The first is related to uh, alcohol um, at Maple Crest Park and Springfield Avenue Cazibo in regards to events. The second uh, discussion item is regarding our jitney services. And the third uh, discussion item is related to uh, revisions related to cannabis and smoking in our parks. Uh, the fourth and final discussion item is related to our DeHart Park study. From there, we will move on to our consent agenda where we have 18 items. Uh, the, the items include a few approvals uh, for our grant application for roadway improvements. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking at resolutions related to our ABC, which relates to our retail our, uh, consumption, our retail distribution and club licenses related to alcohol. Uh, we will also be appointing uh, a 5G telecommunications consultant. Uh, we have several um, community service department resolutions related to part-time and seasonal hires. 
And then we also are going to be appointing our interim fire chief, who will be replacing uh, Chief Weber. Bills and claims, and then several authorizations from refund and tax overpayments, uh, amendments to our introduced 2021 budget, cancellation of COVID-19 unused balances, and emergency temporary appropriations. The final uh, resolutions on our consent agenda relate to uh, the awarding of a refunding bond, accepting, uh, accepting a donation from the committee representing the Friends of Abrams, and then finally establishing, a, establishing salary for a Maplewood Police Department office assistant. Um, after that, we will have um, our second public comment on any subject matter, it does not have to be on the agenda, and then we will adjourn. So with that, we will start with our resolution, agenda nine number five. Now we'll yield the floor to Mr. Limburg. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, this resolution number 185-21, uh, a commendation on the occasion of the retirement, the retirement uh, of Fire Chief Michael Weber. Uh, we're glad to have Chief Weber here with us tonight. I'm gonna. Uh, present, I'm gonna read this resolution and then I have uh, some personal comments of my own, uh, some of which I'll repeat uh, from last Wednesday's uh, public safety meeting. Whereas the Maplewood Township Committee desires to convey to Fire Chief Michael Weber an expression of its appreciation and grateful acknowledgement for the valued services rendered by him as an employee of the Township of Maplewood and the Maplewood Fire Department for the past 30 years, and whereas Fire Chief Michael Weber has given generously of his time and efforts in a dignified, faithful, friendly, and professional manner to township residents, and whereas the Township Committee sincerely appreciates the worthwhile contributions that Fire Chief Michael Weber has made towards the material development, communal welfare, safety, and quality of life in the township, and whereas on the occasion of his 30 years of service, Michael Weber is retiring to start the next challenging and exciting chapter of his life. Now, therefore, be it resolved, by the Township Committee of the Township of Maplewood, County of Essex, State of New Jersey, the Township expresses to Fire Chief Michael Weber its sincere congratulations on the occasion of his retirement. Second. Uh, Chief, we, we have the, the official resolution for you. It's, it's signed by, uh, by Clerk Fritzen. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, has the, the seal of the Township on it and um, you know, I, I just want to add a few, a few words of thanks, uh, of my own, you know, obviously it's, you know, three decades of service and, um, you know, and obviously your, you know, your history in town goes back long before then, uh, you know, you're, you know, native son of Maplewood, graduate of Columbia high school, um, and, um, you know, have, have served this town for, for a long time and, uh, very deservedly, you know, rose through the ranks of the department, you know, showed your leadership and, uh, you know, my colleagues and I were very proud to promote you to chief, um, you know, while your time in that role uh, may not have uh, been as long as some of your predecessors, it was certainly a very interesting tenure, um, you know, both the, the challenge of, you um, Preparing to uh, potentially combine fire departments with South Orange, we're, we're still working uh, on that consolidation. But but obviously you've you've been assisting us uh, in uh, improving our relationship with South Orange, uh, the fire department there. The um, you know we you know we've you know as you know we've recently signed uh, the um, you know the agreement with them. We've been doing a lot of joint training. We just completed our uh, our, our live burn training, our joint training with South Orange, um, our joint response agreement, uh, which you work closely with, uh, with Chief Sullivan and others on. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the most impressive uh, thing that I'm really going to remember from your tenure as chief, um, and, and I'm sure some in the, you're not going to forget any time soon, uh, is the way that you led our department uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, you know, although, you know, we had a lot of first responders in Maplewood, a lot of folks on the front line, 
Um, you know, the, the firefighter EMTs uh, were, you know, were, were, were at the very front of the front lines. Um, you know, when we had those COVID those service, those emergencies, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, you and, and, your, and your guys were uh, responding to those folks who were sick uh, and at the height of the pandemic were the ones taking those calls. Um, and even though, um, you know, the, you know your, uh, your EMTs, your firefighters could have taken vacation time, they could have called out sick. Uh, we actually had, uh, you know, at least during my tenure and as far back as I've seen statistics, uh, the lowest vacation and sick time uh, in the history of the department uh, during those months at the height of the pandemic. Uh, you know, not only did that help us in terms of, uh, you know, in a tough budget time, not having to pay overtime, but, uh, you know, it helped us to, to cover those shifts and to, to actually provide adequate staffing at a time when we really needed it. Uh, and, you know, when, when the township really most needed the Maplewood Fire Department and NREMTs, uh, the Maplewood Fire Department delivered and stepped up. And uh, that's certainly thanks in large part to your leadership. Uh, I think you can be very proud uh, of your time as chief. Uh, and we're certainly very proud of you. Uh, we're very thankful to you. Uh, and we're grateful for your service. And we wish you very well in your retirement. And, and, and you're on mute, Chief. So but if, if you'd like to say a few words, we'd love to hear from you. I, I, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for, uh, for that resolution and for your kind words. Um, just a few, uh, few words. I, um, it's certainly been an honor and a privilege to serve uh, for 30 years with such an outstanding fire department. And I mean that wholeheartedly. That's not just words. Um, I've been surrounded by excellence, not only within the fire department, but throughout the township. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the department for um, displaying such courage and, and perseverance through, you know, as you mentioned, my tenure uh, kind of carried us through a, a, a strange and challenging time, but uh, they really did step up. And as, as challenging as it was, they made my job easy. And you really, you know, you, you truly have an exceptional fire department made up of some of the most motivated and qualified uh, 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 men a, a chief could ever ask for. Um, uh, I, I just like to thank uh, the Public Safety Committee have always been supportive of my of me and the department uh, for as long as I've been here. Um, and um, I'd like to just mention a couple people that have been here for uh, for pretty much as long as I have, some some longer. Um, Liz Fritzen has always been a, a, an advocate for the fire department, a friend, and always helped out whenever she could. And I want to thank her. Uh, Roger Desiderio was uh, always a good counsel and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, just whenever you really need a good opinion and, and advice, he was a man and he always was there on the spot whenever you needed him. I'd like to thank him. Uh, Chief Duvall has uh, certainly had challenges uh, recently, too, and done, an, I think, done a great job. And I'd like to thank him for his uh, counsel when I needed as well. And um, just wish you all good luck and let you know that you are in really good hands. You have uh, exceptional men, great leadership, and I think the fire department will thrive going forward. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Would anyone else like to uh, say a few words to, to Chief? Mayor, I think we need to vote on the resolution, right? Yes, we do. But I know he wants to say a few more words. Okay, I just want to say, uh, Chief, I remember uh, I was the mayor when we uh, interviewed you for Deputy Chief, moving you from a lieutenant up. And I remember that interview very well. And after the interview, we were so impressed by you. I had a conversation with uh, committee person, Jerry Ryan, and we said, why aren't we making this guy chief? Um, and it took a while, but I'm so happy that you finally got to be chief of the department. Um, you've contributed so much. So thank you very much and uh, best in your retirement or your next stage of life. Thank you, Mr. Luca. I really do appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll go next then. Um, you know, Chief, it's interesting because I knew of your, reputa uh, your reputation before you even be <laughs> before I even met you. Um, you know, we always talk shop, and 
and you were you were like that person, like, oh man, you got to meet Michael Weber. He's you know he knows what's going on. He's <laughs> you you had a reputation that was uh, you know, and you lived up to it. Uh, you know, you've been class class act. You've been great to work with, collaborate with. You know, as Mr. Lindbergh talked about, you know, the work that you and, and the entire department did during COVID was unbelievable. You know, unbelievable. And it's because of of the leadership that you provided during that time. They really helped us get through, uh, you know, that period a year ago, um, and really, really appreciate that. And um, you have uh, enhanced uh, the strength, the operations, the legacy, and the culture of our fire department. And for that, I salute you and I appreciate you. And best of luck to you. And now that you're moving on to the next phase of your life, you got to figure out what Big Ten team you're going to root for because you got some family members that are going to be rivals. So good luck on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your words. And uh, I guess I'll root for who's ever uh, at the top of the, the rankings. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> so I just wanted to just, you know, I'm not going to reiterate what everyone said, but, um, you know, you've been great. I wish you were going to be chief longer. Um, I, I was really happy when you stepped in and I just feel like, uh, You've provided really high level professional leadership at the department. Um, and I just really am grateful for, for, your, for that and for your work. And, um, you know, when you get done with all of your chores over the next year, hopefully you can relax or run for office or do whatever. <laughs> but thank you, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for those words, I appreciate it. Chief, I also want to say a couple things. Uh, I want to wish you the best. Lots of fishing, lots of uh, time on the shore, and lots of beers and good times with uh, you and your family. You deserve it. Uh, you've served our town uh, professionally, beautifully. Uh, as the newest member to the governing body, I have always found you to be very welcoming to me, sir. Uh, open door policy. Uh, I've gotten to know you a little bit on a personal level. And, uh, you know, that meant a lot to me. It's often really hard to, uh, it's intimidating to talk to firefighters or, or cops, um, especially uh, for those of us who are, you know, LGBTQ uh, of my generation. It's, uh, we've had some tough times before, uh, but I never felt that with you. You were always accepting and welcoming and uh, you have a big heart. And uh, I hope that heart keeps beating and, and giving you joy and, and lots of good times ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate it. So Chief, we're gonna go ahead and uh, move a resolution on your behalf. So uh, Greg, Mr. Yes, Mayor, I would like to move that we adopt resolution number 185-21 uh, issuing a commendation on the occasion of the retirement of Fire Chief Michael Weber. Second. Second. No discussion. Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. Luca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Thank you, Chief. Congratulations on your retirement. Thanks, Chief. Thank you all again very much. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you sure soon. Okay. Yep. Have a great night. Good night. Okay. We'll now move on uh, in our agenda to agenda item number six. This is public comment on uh, agenda items only. Uh, limit three minutes. Uh, Nick, uh, Mr. Waltz, rather, we will uh, let you uh, start the process. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Township Committee. We will now begin the public comment portion of the meeting. If any meeting attendees would like to address the Township Committee, please, uh, on, agenda, on agenda items only, please use the raise your hand function. We will convert you to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Would anybody like to address the Township Committee? I think you already have um, Mr. Profeta on. I do. So, uh, Glenn, are you going to start to transfer some people over here? Okay. First up, uh, Fred Perfetta, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mayor McGehee, members of the Township Committee, I'm here tonight to uh, address you about the tree ordinances, which is on your agenda. Um, I first want to say I'm very happy that this ordinance has been revised and um, just, um, in favor of, the, of its substantial approval. Uh, the appeal rights have certainly been strengthened. The standards have been clarified. 
And there's no doubt that more trees in Maplewood will be protected because of it. But I want to say uh, that there's one big gap in this ordinance as it now stands. We talked about it last time, but I don't think you really got to it in discussion. Uh, and I appeal to you to correct that now. It has to do with the trees to stand in the way of development. As this ordinance now is written, there's only, the only ones that are, that are protected from development are historic trees and rare trees of which we have none at the moment. But I will tell you this, every one of you, I will bet, would say that there are trees that are old enough or big enough that they should not be sacrificed on the altar of development. That's the gap. You haven't got that protected yet. I mean, what if a tree, and there are plenty of them in Maplewood, is 250 years old? That tree is older than the nation. Are we going to sacrifice that tree to a developer? What if a tree is over four feet in diameter? Can't get your arms around it. Are you going to say that property rights trump that tree's right to keep on living? I don't think so. I think that's an error. I think you just, I think it's something that you should fix. I want you to do this something for me. I want you to take a look at Summit's tree ordinance. It's very, it's very well written. And it's, and it's not very long. They have a category called landmark trees. And if the city forester in Summit finds that a tree is rare or more than a hundred years old or of abnormal height or abnormal diameter for a tree of that species or has aesthetic value that is of special value to the city of Summit, that tree does not get trumped by development. Now, you know, I'm not asking you to go as far as Summit goes, but I'm asking you to pick an age or a size, which you would say to yourself, oh my goodness, no, nobody's taking this tree down for a pool or a deck or an auxiliary building. This tree is sacred. That's what I would like you to do, because I think that's what Maplewood is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Perfetta. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Bob McCoy. You have three minutes. You're muted, sir. Okay, uh, good evening. I have three points about the DeHart Park proposal that I uh, would like to share with you. Um, the first one is, uh, some history and some demographics. DeHart Park was established in June of 1938. Um, the Maplewood News editorialized at the time that it will serve as a central feature of the general project to improve the southern section of Maplewood, and that it appears that the south of Maplewood is about to embark on a new and better period in its long history. Fast forward to the present, and it's clear that the neighborhood residents need this park now more than ever. The census tract south of Springfield Avenue is by far our most densely populated one. 27% of our residents live in this single census tract, including 1,400 between the ages of five and 19 years old. Three quarters of the residents classify themselves as black or African American. According to the latest figures available, it has a per capita income of less than 33,000. Compare this to the three census tracts to the Northwest, which have per capita incomes between 80 and 90,000. We should be looking ways for beyond the recently opened basketball court to help the neighborhood residents experience the park in its natural setting more fully. It defies all principles of economic, social, and racial justice that these residents be asked to cede a substantial portion of this park to the exclusive use of sports teams that are primarily from outside this neighborhood. The park was built for a community that needs it, and that should remain its first function. Second, it defies all good reason that strip mining the soil from DeHart and spending 1.8 million on a couple of hundred tons of plastic, rubber, and silica sand in its place is in any way a virtuous or sustainable undertaking. The teams are clamoring for a field that they can use on those days when the weather doesn't cooperate. Or they're on a fool's errand. Once installed, the artificial surface will be an addiction. The artificial field at Underhill was opened in 2009. Earlier this year, a representative of the MAPSO Recreational Fields Task Force testified, we were incredibly vocal in 2019. Now the turf fibers are decaying at an alarming rate. An injury will occur on this field, a negligent suit will be filed. It's simply inevitable. 
end quote. Their answer, spend another 1.2 million for another eight to 10 years and then get incredibly vocal again, demanding yet another replacement. Experience elsewhere has shown that investing a small portion of the 1.8 million will fix the problems in the current grass field that were created during its construction, allowing ongoing maintenance and annual recovery at a much lower cost. It's been done repeatedly elsewhere with the proper will that has been lacking that's been lacking over the last decade, Maplewood can do so as well. Final question, how can you conclude that this is the most urgent expenditure of our precious capital budget? Is filling out the missing 25% for a group of several hundred that already has the privilege of using 75% of their schedule really a higher priority than figuring out how to enrich the lives of some of the thousands of youth and adults who do not play field sports? Beyond recreational needs like year-round swimming pool, what about our dangerous sidewalks, vulnerable electric infrastructure, potholed roads, Aging sewers, Rawway Greenway. That is your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCoy. Next up, Mayor, we have Jane Conrad. You have three minutes. My name is Jane Conrad. Oh, sure not. Sorry. I've published several articles, mainly in the Village Green, describing how artificial turf is a threat to users' health to the environment and to community budgets. I generally oppose converting public green space to plastic fields. However, tonight I would like to focus on, on why I believe it would be a particular injustice to make DeHart plastic in a neighborhood where incomes are lower, lots are smaller, and access to natural areas is more limited. I learned of the DeHart community's opposition to artificial turf when it was under consideration in 2008. My kids attended Seth Boyden School and I worked with kids in the gardens there during recess pretty much every day from 2002 to 2012. It seemed to me that the community valued open green space and kids access to nature. But I also thought at the time, if this community wants artificial turf, who am I to stand in the way? So in July, 2008, I went door to door in the Seth Boyden neighborhood, asking whether people had heard about this issue, what they thought about it, and if they would like a chance to vote on it in a ballot referendum. What I learned was that people there really valued DeHart as a natural park with grass and trees. I heard a lot of stories about how people use the park, playing pickup games, flying kites, playing with toddlers on the lawn, having fun in the snow, having picnics, relaxing after work, having a place to take their shoes off and feel the grass. Some people pointed out that summer day camps and nursery schools use that field. And that DeHart is where the cooling center is located for those without air conditioning in the summer. Why would the town take away grass and replace it with hot plastic? I was asked over and over. So the community overwhelmingly opposed converting to heart to artificial turf. Um, in two days, I collected 184 signatures calling for a ballot referendum. And in November two, 2008, that census tract voted 60% against artificial turf. So please reconsider this idea. Remember your responsibility to consider the needs and rights of all residents and not just a vocal few. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Conrad. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Jonathan Poor. You have three minutes. Good evening, my name is Jonathan Poor, 35 Roosevelt Road. Um, thanks to the TC members for being willing to serve. I am opposed to the proposal to install an artificial plastic sports surface on the grass fields at DeHart Park for three reasons. It's an environmental disaster, a financial disaster, and an environmental injustice. But I would like to focus on my experience with the current grass fields at DeHart. The state of the fields at DeHart features prominently in the loud complaints heard from the sports people. Assertions are made that the fields are somehow unplayable or even dangerous. These claims are absurd. The fields, while not perfect, are certainly playable. I, along with Bob McCoy, have been working to improve the fields of Dark DeHart for over a decade. I have spent countless hours at the field trying to understand and address deficiencies. 
We got a grant in 2014 to train town employees in natural turf management, and we pushed for the town to contract with a qualified sports turf maintenance company, 2014 to 2016. Conditions at the field were at their best during this period and only declined when the town decided it could bring maintenance in-house. I, uh, I can direct you to a video on YouTube of the field in May of 2016, and it looks great. Um, and all this time, though, I never encountered anyone from the sports clubs interested in improving conditions. My experience with the field leads me to say that the deficiencies in the field stem not from overuse, but rather from initial construction errors compounded by inconsistent maintenance and neglect. Uh, there's not enough time to give you the whole history, but during the initial construction, the subsoil and parts of the field were severely compacted. This has led to chronic retention of water after heavy rains, which in turn hinders healthy growth. These areas do not correlate well with areas of highest use, interestingly. Several studies of water infiltration on the field by Rutgers in 2011 and 2019 have noted this and made recommendations for remediation, none of which have been followed. Maintenance has been inconsistent due to personnel changes, funding issues, and inattention from leaders. As a result, many opportunities have been missed. Uh, one of many examples, during the pandemic, when usage was low, the field could have been extensively aerated and overseeded. 30 seconds. never did happen. I believe in short that we haven't exhausted the possibilities of having a healthy, resilient grass field, but we need leadership and volunteers to take up the challenge rather than a chorus of complaints. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poor. Next up, Mayor, we have Maisie Conrad Poor. Give three minutes. Hello, um, I'm also here to talk about DeHart Park. Um, as a Maplewood resident, I have my own fond memories of running around DeHart Park as a child. But more importantly, we need you to talk to the residents who live near this space as they will be most affected in ways that you cannot pretend to know without asking. A public park is more than a soccer field. It is a green space, a community space, a place where people can gather young and old and enjoy a natural environment. Friends of mine who live in the area talk about how important it is to have access to green spaces especially when you live in an, in an apartment complex where access to plants and nature is already limited. I have heard people express interest in planting gardens of their own if only they had the space to do it. This should be their space. Know that by making this decision, you would be depriving them of all of those opportunities. An artificial turf field means only access to people who own cleats, only access to those on sports teams, only access to those who are fit to run on a surface that gets hotter than asphalt. Artificial turf affects the health and safety of all of the people who are exposed to it. There are microparticles that are dangerous to breathe and the heat from the field will be unbearable in the summer. The toxins from the rubber pellets will wash into streams and the quality of the soil will deteriorate causing dust and erosion. The health costs and environmental costs are too numerous to list here. The consequences of the proposed artificial turf reach far beyond the parameters of the field itself. An artificial turf field will deteriorate over 10 years. And in that time, it will put, have put over 72, sorry, 76.2 tons of carbon into the atmosphere. We would have to plant approximately 1,861 trees to undo that damage alone. And this doesn't even include the carbon emitted in manufacturing or transporting the field or the 113 tons of carbon generated by incinerating it. And then you would need a new field. We have less than 10 years to prevent the most devastating effects of climate change. Is this really the decision that we all want to make? By contrast, a grass soccer field sequesters approximately 70,040 pounds of CO2 in those 10 years. And if the grass dies, you can replant it. Um, I want everyone on this township committee to feel the weight of this decision uh, because it is permanent and the effects are long lasting. Think of who this affects and how. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Port. Mayor, next up we have Christine Doyle. You have three minutes.
You're still muted. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Christine Doyle. Um, I'm a Maplewood mom. Um, and my daughter, Annabelle, has been playing soccer for Cougar Soccer Club um, since she was four. And I'm um, here to talk about the, um, the turf field um, at DeHart or the possibility of a turf field at DeHart. Um, my daughter is now in fifth grade, um, so she's played soccer there for quite a long time. Um, she played, she also plays Cougar lacrosse, um, and she's uh, a very active uh, little girl. Um, I always knew that our fields were not in the best condition, but it wasn't until we began traveling for games that I realized how far behind SOMA was in providing a well-maintained quality field for its child athletes. Um, many times we would face other teams that consistently practiced and played games on a turf field, and we struggled to compete with them. We were used to a much slower game in which the ball would lollygag across the bumps on the field. Um, and it's been harder for our girls to learn ball skills. Um, and frankly, there have been moments where it's been dangerous. Um, lots of tripping. Um, just this past weekend at our final home game of the season, um, I heard a player from the other team say, why is this field so bumpy? Um, I feel it's embarrassing for our athletic teams to host their home games on this field. And that's when the, and that's when the game actually happens. We all know how much valuable playing time is lost due to the wet fields and rain. Um, by not addressing this issue again and again, it seems as if our towns are repeatedly telling our child athletes that what they do is not important. These are hardworking, dedicated, and often passionate kids who want to feel pride in their hometown when they host a home game. These athletes are unable to play to their full potential in these conditions. It's certainly possible that student athletes from our towns will not be able to compete with those in other towns uh, for scholarships and other academic athletic opportunities if we do not support them now. One final note, some of the turf fields that we have played, um, where we have played, have been located in more, in more populated areas where the amount of green space is even less than Maplewood. Yet these turf fields are welcoming and accessible to many athletes and their families, playing a variety of different sports and all spectators and friends. One example is Alden Park, where our U10 grant girls had the pleasure of practicing over the winter. As the girls wrap up their practice, the football team um, waits for their turn to practice under the lights. It was a diverse communal space where all athletes could come together and their families and friends could share a love of sports. A turf field at the heart- That is your time. Will bring the community to- Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Eric Shorter. You have three minutes. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. I do not have a written statement, so I will be speaking from the heart. I am a resident of Maplewood community for 17 years, and I've lived in the same home two blocks away from DeHart Park for my tenure here in Maplewood. My daughters, were all raised, went through the school system. My youngest was a, is a rising senior. My two older daughters have graduated. We went through Seth Boyden, MMS, and CHS. In the neighborhood, we used the field. As little children, my daughters ran barefoot in the grass on hot summer days. I played in the field. I had dogs. We ran in the field when it was snowing, raining, however you want to look at it. In 2008, I took up the charge to maintain grass. And like Jonathan Poor, I believe that the maintenance of a grass field should be our top priority. Figuring out how to make it work should be what the sports community should be looking at. Not let's keep up with the Joneses and do the most expedient thing, which is dispose of the grass and bring in the turf. Again, if we are going to be a sustainable community, if we are to think globally and act locally, 
right here at home, the best use of our space is green space. I don't know why we're even having this discussion, given everything that we know about the environmental um, impact of artificial turf, given everything that we know about our current climate crises around the world, acting locally is in our best interest. And I do understand that Ritzer Field is already on the table and Underhill is already proposed to be replaced. I don't understand why we would make every effort as a sports community and as a whole community to preserve natural grass. And let's figure out a way to make it work. If it's not working, surely there's a solution. And our collective brain power should be dedicated towards finding that solution, not seconds. just the easy way out and the disposable turf field. I work in the schools. I have students that were recently given clearance to play on their little Gaga field and it's turf. The first day they came back into the class, they took off their shoes. There was crumb rubber all over the classroom floor. That stuff gets everywhere. It's horrible. Grass fields, 80 degree weather, you can go out and be cool. 80 degree weather on turf, I'm not out there. That is your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shorter. And thank you again for your uh, efforts on Sunday at the Juneteenth event. Next up, Mayor, we have Lucario Shorter. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Lucera Shorter. Um, I live three blocks from DeHart Park and have for 17 years. And in 2019, I graduated from Columbia High School. I played on the field hockey team for all four of my years there. And that being the case, I'm no stranger to the disputes that surround the conflicting team practice schedules and the shortcoming of our practice areas. All students at that school and in this town have been emphasizing the need for more functional sports areas in our district and a better management of our sports facilities and fields in our district. But why I'm speaking here today is out of concern for the current course of plans. The youth of this town with whom I've spoken are in agreement that the current plan to turn to heart and other fields into turf facilities are severely misguided. Our current needs can't be solved by simply turning grass into plastic so it looks prettier to rent out to private team events. We, the children, have been begging for an overhaul and an upgrade of our Underhill turf facility, not just the reconstruction of field lines and redoing the turf to fill the ACL tearing holes that our lacrosse girls have fallen victim to, but especially in lights of the events that occurred at that very facility, there should be no discussion of constructing new turf facilities without first ensuring the safety of the facility we currently have, first putting working utilities and putting cameras and security in every corner, every dugout of that facility, and noting that Underhill has desperately needed more attention for years, and it is harrowing that conditions remain as they currently are and left opening for tragedy to occur without security cameras to catch it and serve justice to their offender. Furthermore, it's concerning to see the lack of regard for carbon emissions from this council in regards to this plan, as if it's still the 80s and pushing off quote unquote hippies and the environmental needs is a professional thing to do. My generation is painfully aware that we will live to see the disastrous effects of climate change. And we often sit with nihilistic ideations because we, because we know that, or we fear that a future for us is not promised as it was for you. Climate change will affect us before we can retire as our esteemed fire chief just did. The G7 council met just last week and made what have been noted as empty promises that fall short of carbon reduction goals that we need on a national level. We desperately need change and we need it on a local level. And it starts right here. It starts with you making decisions and using your power to promise us, your children, that you are at least trying, that you are at least trying, not brushing off reports of how damaging a proposal like this could be to our crumbling environment. The change we really desperately need starts right here with you making decisions that will work towards these goals. It will be work and work is hard, but hard work is worth doing. It is worth it for your children, for the planet. Leave it better than you found it. Turf is a shallow attempt to create a more appealing appearance of, uh, as it was put, a non-embarrassing field. 
it is, is your time more to propagate a healthy field. Thank you, Ms. Shorter. Mayor, next we have Laurel Kearns. You have three minutes. First, as a teacher, let me say that we should be very proud of our youth and we should be particularly listening to them. I moved to Maplewood 27 years ago to teach sociology, religion, and environmental studies at Drew University. And most of my courses involve readings and discussions of environmental justice, which can be defined this way. The placement of a facility by decision makers outside of that community that has negative environmental impact on the community where it is located, often placed there with insufficient consultation in the neighborhood. This usually involves differences in racial and class status between the decision makers and the community. DeHart Park is clearly an environmental justice issue. It is the only notable green space on the south side of Springfield, and it is a significant green space due to the zoning of that part of town. Closer, smaller lots or apartment complexes mean less trees combined with industrial facilities or buildings with large footprints. Discussions of urban environmental justice issues increasingly include urban heat islands and the health consequences. A colleague at Drew shared with me a heat island map of New Jersey, which I'm glad to share with others. And DeHart is obviously located in a hotter area of Maplewood. On that map, it is quite easy to pick out the artificial turf fields in any town or campus, because all studies of artificial turf mention how much significantly hotter the surface and surrounding air is. The result of placing so much plastic surface into heart would lead to an increased heat index in an already hotter area in a time of global warming and increasing temperatures. It could affect the ambient temperature and use of the other recreational facilities located at DeHart and could lead to higher cooling costs and potential health consequences for residents, especially if residents can't afford those higher cooling costs. I will leave it to others to discuss the impact of playing on such hot fields and the players themselves and the necessary restrictions on play due to weather and the injuries related to playing on it. I know our kids hated it. In conversation with Professor Gabriella Cutting of Rutgers University, where she teaches environmental justice and political science department, she noted that in environmental justice, you distinguish between procedural justice where certain groups are excluded in decision-making processes and distributive justice, where things are distributed unequally. Both are relevant to any decision about to heart. She goes on to comment that, quote, artificial- 30 seconds. Will substantially deteriorate the environment of the lower income Maplewood population who don't have much access to green spaces to start with. Artificial turf benefits those who can afford to play these pricey sports for their children and puts an environmental burden on the local neighborhood. I find it very worrying that these relatively open spaces that fulfill an important ecological function, which ultimately contributes immensely to human health, are to be smothered in plastic, unquote. In sum, this is an issue of environmental injustice. That is your time. And if one considers the impact of- Thank you, Ms. Kearns. Mayor, next we have Allie Leonard, three minutes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm on the fly here. And so I'm gonna speak without a script as I often do and I'm always multitasking. Uh, and I have uh, two children here in Maplewood. We've lived here about 10 years. And those of you who know me in person know that I am neither uh, a hardcore environmentalist nor um, somebody who is an advocate at all costs for uh, situations that will vastly impact the environment in a negative way. Uh, I am a card-carrying Shinnecock Indian, a federal Indian, so I have a, a special interest in preserving everything for the seventh generation. Having said that, um, I, I find it very interesting then in all of the folks who are critical of turf fields, which the uh, absence of which have really impacted the play for my son who plays on Cougars and has been playing since he was about five and is now nine um, with, as many have stated, the children losing uh, many games uh, and opportunities to play because the fields are not draining and they are not uh, usable. Having said that, 
I don't hear anybody mentioning alternatives in the turf space to uh, plastics that gas off and that cause carbon problems. And um, without doing very much research at all, I'm aware of uh, coconut husk and cork fibers um, that are being used very ably in facilities for professional play around the country that are more environmentally friendly and also being natural fibers most likely absorb heat even better. Um, I have a daughter who's just begun field hockey and she's in North Carolina right now playing on a coconut husk field. So it can be done. My position is that the first action at the heart should be to preserve the grass and the green space as it has been noted and requested if possible by improving drainage at the field. Um, I do not believe creating an environmentally responsible turf field will take away from a tremendous amount of resident 30 um, seconds. enjoyment. And uh, we have also been property owners in the Hilton section and still are. Uh, however, the second option should be for the township to consider using some of this precious budget to make these improvements in an environmentally sound way as a compromise. And I do believe that it can be done and it is being done elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leonard. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Mike Connolly. You have three minutes. Hello, thank you, Township. Um, I'm here to speak out in favor of the consideration of a turf field. Um, you know, this is my son, Rylan, over my corner. I coach uh, a girls soccer team. My daughter's upstairs taking a shower after a softball game right now, so she couldn't attend. But, you know, I think we are listening to the children. The children notice that they can't practice as much as they want, that they don't get the home games that they want, that they can't be out there on the field. At a time during the pandemic when it was so critical to get our kids outside and playing, our fields were closed for five straight months, November, December, January, February, March. That's five months when DeHart was closed. No one had access to those fields for five months. If you have turf, if you have the ability to keep those fields open, people can be outside playing. November is a time when you got in play. You can put a hat on. You can be playing outside. When the spring rains come and the heart's too flooded and you can't touch it in March, you can be out there because the field will drain better. This can be a field where we can give better access to our children and have practice closer. We don't have to drive over to West Orange for practice. We can keep practice more closer to where our kids are. This can help equity and inclusion because you don't have to have travel so far for practice. You can stay in Maplewood to practice. We can have more home games. This becomes less of a burden on parents to get players to out of town. When I'm scheduling my games as a Cougar coach, I try to schedule away as much as possible because I know the game will be played. I know that if my girls can play that weekend, if we play at home, there's a pretty good chance it's getting canceled. It's almost, it feels like it's 50-50 if our game is going to get rained out. Because if we get rain on a Friday, it's too wet to play by the time Sunday comes. These turf fields will allow the town and everybody in the community to have access to those fields for 12 months of the year. And people will get out there in November, December, January, February. We were looking to practice. Go up to Underhill Field any winter weekend. It is packed with a huge amount of diverse children and diverse adults in this community playing, practicing, looking for anywhere to play. We need a solution. I would love to have a grass field. What it looks like doesn't matter to me. Just have it open. And the grass fields can't stay open. There's too much demand on these. Turf solves that problem. Please think about how we can keep these fields open for the entire community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Richard Wiener. You have three minutes. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I am here to oppose uh, the, uh, the uh, proposition for the turf field. I, um, as opposed to repeating what has already been said, let me try to make a, one or two different points. I've spent some time in the last week or two uh, trying to find uh, expertise, uh, and we have a fair amount on the, in the town, but trying to find other expertise around the country um, that relates to the, some of the issues that we're concerned about here. Um, and I want to present you with one thing. I will, I will mail you a copy of this uh, right after the meeting, uh, but I have been in touch with people at the Children's Environmental Health Center at the Mount Sinai Institute uh, part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center. These are MD PhDs who do research on a number of issues related to children's environment and uh, how that affects health. And I want you to note that they have put out a flyer for parents 
uh, on artificial turf. And the whole point of the flyer is how to keep help parents keep their children safe and safer than they might otherwise be. Uh, the flyer points out some of the issues with artificial turf, things that uh, you've heard described uh, previously and talked about in terms of some of the potential carcinogens that are in the substances in artificial turf. If we knew exactly which kind of field we're talking about, I think we could be more specific. But I want to note for you, as you think about this, and certainly some of the people that have already spoken today, especially some of the people that have young children that are going to be playing on this, they provide tips for safer play on an artificial surfaces. So for parents to consider, their tips include don't use it on very hot days. Um, they, they want, they suggest avoiding using the field for passive activities, as opposed to a grass field. You don't go and set up a table or just sit and have a picnic. Uh, monitor young children to prevent accidental ingestion of infill. Avoid walking with bare feet. Wash hands before eating, drinking, or touching mouth. This is after playing a nice game of soccer, I would assume. Clean cuts and abrasions immediately. Brush your hair thoroughly after play. Remove and clean shoes and gear outside before getting in a car to return home. Take off shoes and shake out equipment and clothes outside or over garbage before- 30 seconds. Shower immediately after playing. Vacuum any infill that comes into your home. These are not people that have a stake in artificial turf other than for children's health. Again, I'll send this to all of you. I think it's something that you need, you owe it to town to at least take a close look at. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Warner. Okay, Mayor, next up we have Brian Callahan. You have three minutes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Township Committee members, um, Brian Callahan, Prospect Street in Maplewood. Um, you know, I just hope that everybody that's been on talking about the uh, turf and its bad parts stay on the meeting because later on, the experts that you as a township committee have hired to bring in are going to talk to all those points, especially the point where they talk about heat and over excessive heat. There are new components that bring the field heat levels down by 35 degrees. So it does make the field playable year round and not unplayable, which some comments have been made today. So why the heart? The heart is an ideal location to convert to the field of, of turf. It's an existing field with a footprint free of trees and obstructions. It's the only fenced and public uh, and lighted public field in Maplewood. The heart is an existing activity complex with parking and public restrooms. The heart is a short walking distance to Maplecrest, yet another large park in the town and it's just about three to four block walk away. Not everybody has a park right in their backyard and we all do need to walk a little bit to get the extra exercise and use our parks. Um, why not use Maplecrest? Maplecrest is not lighted. It has significant landscaping required to make the large, to clear potentially large trees. Significant fill and leveling would be required to convert the location. Why not Memorial Park? Memorial Park is designated as a historic district and is not available to convert, nor does it have lighting. Orchard Park. Orchard Park, it's not lighted and it's not large enough footprint for a multi-sport facility. Borden Park, again, not lighted and not large enough for a multi-sport facility. Chiswitz, although in Maplewood, is a park owned and maintained by South Orange, so that's off the board. Any and all recreational and organized programs are open to all children and adults and, and adult residents um, without restriction. Scholarships and funding are available to those who are in need. Um, significant advancements, as I said, have been made over the decades to ensure the safety and environment for those who use the surface. We can coordinate, <laughs> obviously later on, you have a whole presentation to present and talk to the um, acts of, and the, the actual surface itself. So I'll leave that to the experts to clear those um, questions up uh, to their presentation. Um, I appreciate everyone's time and understanding and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. Okay, Nick, Mr. I think Ma we're- I Mayor, think we're, Township uh, Committee, I think we're all set. Yeah, so hearing that we'll close our town. Oh, we have, oh, we have one more. <laughs> we have one more. Apologize, Mayor. No um, we have Mike Lasowski, you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Township Committee, I appreciate you taking the time to 
discuss this matter today. Um, I've been on multiple calls regarding this. As someone who's grown up in Maplewood and South Orange since the age of five, I'm 49 years old. I've been a taxpaying resident since 2003, raising four children in town, all kids active in athletics. Um, it's not a question of, do we not want more green space in Maplewood? We all want green space. We appreciate green space. It's fantastic. As Brian Callahan pointed out, we have multiple parks in the area. We have multiple parks across Maplewood. We all live in different sections of Maplewood. I happen to live near Underhill Field, another turf facility, but again, not part of the Maplewood discussion owned by the Board of Ed. This issue is, are we committed to providing access to our youth and adult community? Are we committed to uh, uh, aspiring to give our children the opportunity to excel in athletics, to give them the ability to build self-esteem, the ability to become a better person, sportsmanship, teamwork, et cetera. These are things that we pride ourselves in and we wanna give our youth. Yet as a community, we're, we're giving our, can, our, 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 I'm sorry, our children are at a disadvantage. We do not have the facilities. Our grass facilities across the entire town are overused. They do not have drainage. They do not have lights and therefore we cannot use them most of the time. So even having these grass facilities, they're not even being used. DeHart is a great example of, if it rains, there is no field. Anyone who spoke earlier about going to the park and it's a green facility, I have never seen anyone have a picnic at DeHart on the field. I've never seen people out there trying to plant grass or plant uh, um, vegetables. There's a great vegetable farm in the parking lot of Maplewood Pool. If you want to go plant, you can go do that there. But those that are against it, I think I have to ask a question. Do you have children in town? Have you lived here long enough to support the youth that we have? It's time for Maplewood to make a decision. We're, we're asking for a multi-purpose field that will be utilized to give our other fields time to rest, time to re regenerate. At this point, if we don't do that, all of our fields are going to continue to deteriorate. The blankets that we put on the, the fields, all they really do is give you some additional seed and additional uh, uh, growth of the, the grass, but as soon as it rains, as soon as they're used, it doesn't work. We had a vote on this about 12 years ago. I can't believe it was voted down. There was, was a big uproar about the environmental concerns. Brian, great job bringing it up. You're gonna hear from the experts shortly. You're gonna hear about the, the vast changes that have been made that bring this back to what it really should be. It's not as environmentally impactful as you make it. And for anyone who mentioned New York City and all those experts, they all go play at Battery Park City. It's a turf facility. It's not grass. So Here's I'm sorry, but that's what happens. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lowski. Uh, are we, Nick, are we good? Uh, we have one more mayor, uh, Lucia Ramirez. Three minutes. Hello. Hi, I'm a soccer. I don't have a really much knowledge on science and all this stuff. But what I'm gonna tell is by my experience. I live in Maple since in 1998. I moved from Summit, but um, I'm a soccer mom, four kids. They all, two of them are about to, uh, one graduate from uh, high school and another one is about to graduate. They all play soccer. I know that feels really well when it rains, when it snows, we know that stuff. Um, also, I'm a landscaping. So it's been a few times when our, our fields really needs a little extra care. And unfortunately the companies, they run that. And me as a person who has almost 15 years experience cutting grass and, and everything on the field is any in, in extra maintenance. Um, as a soccer mom, I really, we love to have a turf field. The reason why is because my kids, friends, kids, they always have an emotional, panics attacks. And the only way to get the stress out is go out there, kick the ball, do this, do that. And it also helps them <clears throat> to get the, 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 the mental health in place. So this is not about who wants, I know it's an environment thing, but as a mother and as a mother, as a person who deals with grass every single day, I know how the grass grows and everything. And unfortunately the money haven't the, the, the care the those all the fields needs need to be um need to be taken care is not been doing it so that's one of the reasons that I'm in favor of the 
indoor field because I really, I will love to have my kids, the friends, play the tournaments. A lot of kids of our town, some people who doesn't have kids and doesn't care. I'm sorry, I had to tell you, there's a lot of kids in town, they have potential. Some of our, ki our kids, they ended up living in town, moving to Morriston, moving to Charm, moving to Mendham. Mendham where I have most of my customers. Why? Because the way that a town does things, please. Keep in mind, this is about kids' mental health. It's not what the adults want, what they don't want. I never, I always try to stay in the middle. But this is very important as a mental health and don't kill the potential of the kids. Pretty soon, one of our kids is gonna be playing on a World Cup and bring the walk, uh, the cup to this town. And you know what? 30 seconds. It would, be, it would be nice for say, you know what? Because the community did the right thing. They support the sports. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. It was great to hear a refreshing perspective. Nick, that's it. We'll close the public comment. I'm looking at it. Thank you. All right, that was great. Last comment. All right, we'll now move on to agenda item number seven, uh, which is our 2021 municipal budget. Uh, so uh, as tradition, we will start uh, this particular process here. Um, so, um, We'll hear from Mr. Daffis. Uh, when he's unmuted. Yeah, did you have a resolution? <laughs> uh, can can you hear me power. now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mr. Daffis. Apologies. Mayor, I have a resolution to present at this time amending the municipal budget for the year 2021. A public hearing is not required for this amendment. The clerk will read the resolution. Yes, uh, Mayor, that's going to be resolution number 164-21, and it'll be adoption of the 221 uh, budget. Uh, it's actually resolution 188-21 to amend the budget first, Ms. Fritzen. Okay. I offer the foregoing resolution and move its adoption. I second the motion. All right. We Let, have, let's, yeah. let's, oh, just hang on one second. I'm sorry. Let's not have any confusion, all right, since we're doing the budget. Mr. Kologi, there is a there is a, a resolution 181-21 that Mr. Daffis did not move. Is that correct? We are moving, uh, I think it's 188-21, which is to amend the budget first. There was a clerical error in our introduced budget, so the state wants us to first amend it and put the two numbers in the correct columns, and then we'll be free to adopt the budget. Mr. Daffis, are you okay moving that resolution? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Desiderio. Is there a second to that? I second it. Yes, and I'm okay with it. Hearing that it's been moved and seconded, um, I will put a motion up to uh, to vote by asking Ms. Fritzen to call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. The resolution is adopted. Mr. Kologi, am I correct that you now want resolution 164-21 to be considered by the governing body? Yes, sir. Mr. Daffis, will you move that resolution, please? Yes, Mr. Desiderio, I move uh, that resolution and I move its adoption. And that's the second. adoption of the 2021 budget, right, Mr. Kologi? Ms. Kologi saying yes. I I second the motion for 164-21, the adoption of the 2021 budget. Hearing that resolution number 164-21 uh, has been moved and seconded, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Resolution number 164-21 is adopted. Ms. Fritzen. I think we're finished. All right. All right. Outstanding. Thank you. Mr. Kolodzie confirmed, do we now have a budget for 2021? 
yes, we now have a budget for 2021. Finance will be very happy to stop overriding and putting resolutions in front of you to temporarily amend the budget. And uh, our work is cut out for us so that department heads could start spending money hopefully by the end of the week. It's been a long, strange trip. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koloje. And thank you, everyone. We'll now move on to agenda item number nine. We have ordinance on final. Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, item nine, ordinance on final passage, ordinance number 3032-21 is an ordinance to amend chapter 271 of the code of the Township of Maplewood entitled Zoning and Development Regulations. This ordinance will readopt certain provisions of ordinance number 2915-18 and make certain modifications to same with regard to alternative treatment centers. This ordinance has been published, copies posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building and copies made available to the general public in accordance with the law. Would anyone like to speak on this ordinance, which is to readopt certain provisions and make certain modifications regarding alternate treatment centers? I see no one, Mayor. Mayor, if I, Mayor, 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 if I may. Please. This matter was this uh, ordinance was sent to the uh, uh, municipal planning board. I received a memo from them indicating the planning board at their meeting on June 8th discussed the uh, matter and that the planning board passed a resolution with a finding that the ordinance is consistent with the master plan. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. Hearing Mr. Desiderio's point and also uh, closing our public hearing, I will now entertain a motion. I move this ordinance be adopted as a whole and the clerk be directed to publish the same as a past ordinance in the Maplewood South Orange news record according to law. May I get a second, please? Second. All right. Thanks. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll close. And Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. We'll now move on to agenda item number 10. This is the first of three ordinances on introduction. Mayor, uh, item 10, introduction of new ordinance, ordinance number 3033-21 is an ordinance to amend chapter 227 of the code of the Township of Maplewood entitled Shade Trees. This ordinance will revise the procedures for securing a permit to remove a shade tree within Maplewood and will adjust the fines for violations of the provisions of the ordinance. I get a motion, Mr. DeLuca. I move the passages of this ordinance on first reading, its publication according to law in the Maplewood South Orange News Record and the hearing to be held on July 6, 2021. I get a second, Ms. Adams. I'll second it. Do we discuss it at all before we vote or no? Is that just for final? I forget. Yes, for, for final. Um, so we'll discuss it uh, on July 6. Um, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Uh, yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. We're now uh, moving on to agenda item number 11, our second uh, ordinance on introduction. Yes, Mayor. Uh, introduction of new ordinance, ordinance number 3034-21. It's an ordinance to amend chapter 238 of the Code of the Township of Maplewood entitled Stormwater Management. This ordinance will amend the township ordinance regarding stormwater management to be consistent with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection regulations. Can I get a motion, Ms. Adams, please. I move the passage of this ordinance on first reading its publication according to law, the Maplewood South Orange News Record and a hearing to be held on July 6th. Can I get a second, please? Second. Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Uh, we're now at agenda item number 12, our third uh, ordinance on introduction. Yes, Mayor. Uh, item 12, also on introduction, ordinance number 3035-21. It's an ordinance to amend 
certain fees within the Township of Maplewood. This ordinance will amend the fees for use of the Woodland and Bergdorf Center for Performing Arts within the Township of Maplewood. We get a motion, Ms. Adams. I move the passage of this ordinance on its first reading, publication according to law in the Maplewood South Orange News Record and a hearing to be held on July 6th. Thank you. May I get a second? Right. Thank you, Mr. Limbrick. Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGeehy? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. That concludes our ordinance uh, for this evening. We'll now move into reports from departments. Uh, Mr. Dimes, do we have any uh, reports from departments or can we move to administrative reports? Um, we can move to administrative, Mayor. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Dimes. Moving on to agenda item number 14, administrative reports. I will now yield the floor to Mr. Dimes, our township administrator. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple things tonight. Uh, most of them will be brief. Um, as a point of order on the agenda, I would just like to suggest we remove resolution 194 regarding a personnel matter um, with one of our union employees. And I'm still working through some discussions with the union on that resolution. Uh, nothing negative should be inferred from that removal. It's just you no know, administrative issues. So um, we are amicably working through the resolution. Um, as it relates to the police department, um, as you recall, uh, during this budget cycle recently, we bonded for uh, two interceptor vehicles. Um, those vehicles are no longer in production. I've had a couple discussions with the chief over the last several weeks on how we would handle that moving forward. And, you know, I suggested to him uh, the opportunity to look in to the use of electric vehicles, crossovers um, as patrol vehicles in keeping with my a commitment to use EVs whenever possible. Um, he did substantial research and you know agreed with that assessment. And so one of the things we're looking to do now that we don't have those vehicle options anymore that we bonded for was to buy one administrative vehicle and one new of the electric Ford vehicles that would be a patrol unit. Um, I you know bluntly asked him if he felt that purchasing this as a patrol vehicle would compromise any kind of public safety whatsoever to please tell me and I would you know, back off it, but he assured me that he was comfortable with it and he's excited about the opportunity to move the fleet to electric vehicles wherever feasible. So um, if, you know, there's no objection or questions, we would like to move forward with that endeavor. Um, and I'll entertain any questions now or, you know, at another time if you um, would so advise. Any questions for Mr. Johns? I, 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 have, I have a procedural. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Desiderio. Desiderio, please go first. I, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, do we need to amend our resolution then, Mr. Jones? Um, for this one, probably not. I'm going to take a look at how it was written, but the EV is a crossover. I know there's a lot of questions that come up as far as, you know, obviously you can't bond for regular vehicles. You can bond for SUVs and crossovers. This is a crossover electric vehicle. Okay. Let me know. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca, did you have a, a point? I just wanted a procedural question, which was just answered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. I do have a question for Mr. Jimes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Limbrick. Mr. Jimes, um, you know, could you provide an update on the status of, uh, of construction at the Maplewood Community Pool and uh, give us a sense of the likelihood that we'll be able to open uh, on Saturday as scheduled? Yeah, that, that was my next lengthy topic. I was just asking questions. I was entertaining questions about the EV proposal. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, that's my next. Uh, didn't mean to steal your thunder, go, please proceed. Were there any other questions on the EV that you wanted to? I'm, I'm sorry, I do have one other question. Sure. Where would we charge it? Um, we're looking now, since it's only one vehicle, it would be, we would install a station in the garage. Um, as we start to expand, and if this becomes the norm, we would obviously have to look to upgrade the infrastructure over at headquarters. Do you have a, a sense when we would be getting the car, the a police vehicle? I, we're, it's a lengthy time. I mean, it's we're looking at okay. eight months to a year. It's the same lead time as what would have been the other vehicles. So. Okay. Because I'm going to be reporting on the EV grant later, so I think it'll coincide with this. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank so, you, Mr. Luca. Mr. Grimes? Um, on the pool, so I'm just going to spend some time here giving you an update on some of the things that are holding us up, where we've been, and where we're going. So um, 
As you know, this project was given the go ahead in July of last year. It wasn't started till a few months after the contractor was giving that go ahead. So I'm gonna start off this uh, little presentation by just telling you the four points that are actually holding us up from opening at the moment. The first one is we're waiting for the contractor to pour a concrete slab that's going to be used as a driveway uh, near the Boyden area where the filter is being uh, constructed, the purpose of which is to install and hook up the acid tank. Ideally, this would have been done already, but it is not. Um, we're looking at that being done uh, sometime in short order this week. Regarding the, number two, regarding the balancing of the water, the contract requires the contractor provide us a water balance system. Uh, this means that all the chemicals in the system are installed at proper levels. Um, however, the chemical injection system as required by the contractor is not in place and that is also part of the contract. Um, as it relates to the CO2 systems, um, we're dealing with some issues there because the contractor refuses to handle the CO2, which involves moving cylinders and making connections because they say they don't feel comfortable doing that. However, this was part of the initial bid specifications in the contract. To overcome this at the moment, the DPW is assisting them as it relates to pouring slabs and a new contractor is in place tomorrow to deliver this cast and the new tank. <clears throat> um, next, the as I mentioned last week, the tent near the training pool, it was an emergency valve, emergency valve repair that had to be done. It turned out to be a redundant valve, but as a result, the concrete needs to be poured. We are told this will be done next week. Uh, I'm sorry, this week. Um, throughout the course of this project, you know, moving along, as you know, there have been numerous change orders due to unforeseen circumstances or decisions that had to be made to improve the system. Um, I've been advised that before I got here, and of course, since I've been here, that we agreed to all of them under the condition that it wouldn't delay the completion or opening time. The contractor accepted under those conditions. However, that turned out not to bear true. You know, we as a DPW and as a municipality have made several accommodations. You know, we've offered the opportunity for weekend work and we used our DPW resources as part of the contract for things that we were not really required to do or other things that occurred as a result of the contract. You know, our, as I said last meeting, our DPW uh, headed by uh, Mr. Paul Kittner and our recreation department headed by Director Mancuso and the pool staff have been working around the clock and on weekends to do all of what is required by them in order to be ready when the contractor is complete and turns over the pool to us. Many of this was concurrent. However, some of the critical components such as cleaning, installation of dive blocks and ladders and power washing the deck, lifeguard training, final landscaping, in-service training for employees and, and secure structures, you know, couldn't be done or can't be done until it's turned over. Um, even though we're doing the concurrent work and we're starting to do some of that work now that couldn't have been done um, and we're doing it successfully, it was made difficult due to an abrupt resignation of the pool foreman. So our DPW staff is picking up the slack in that regard, along with the recreation staff. Um, regarding staffing, I want to address that we are all staffed up and ready to go. That will not be a reason for the pool not being opening. However, regarding opening, um, unfortunately, we're going to be sending an email indicating that it is unlikely we'll, we will be open uh, this weekend. If something changes, we will announce that. We intend to update all of the pool members every 48 hours from the time of tomorrow's update, even if there is little to update at that point. We want to keep our members informed. Um, however, it should be noted that when we do reopen, it will be without time slots and people will be able to come at will. And, you know, you know, we obviously appreciate the patience of, you know, our, our residents and of people who are members and want to join um, these issues, many of which were, all of which were out of the control of the staff, um, but we are just asking a little more patience in this regard. You know, what we're dealing with is not unique. We know that neighboring communities have had full construction projects and have dealt with these delays, um, but we anticipate hitting those benchmarks in the next couple of days and week to come, week singular, hopefully. And, you know, our staff is doing, you know, what they can. You know, I, I do want to make one very specific comment. I, I think it is, it is very important and it is incumbent upon leadership, you know, whether it's department heads or most importantly, myself as a township administrator, to acknowledge if and when, you know, we played a role in any kind of delays in this project. Um, I want to say unequivocally, after all the research I've done and discussion with people, I do not in any sense believe that to be the case 
whatsoever. Our staff has done everything they were required to do and then some, and any of the delays should not be put on the feet of our director of public works, our engineer, or our director of recreation, who are the key critical people overseeing this project. They did everything they could have possibly done and could not have done anymore. This is not on them. So what I would ask, you know, I'll obviously entertain any questions if I didn't touch on anything that should have uh, been touched on, but what I would ask from the township committee is some type of guidance and maybe some verbal approval and some leeway to accommodate any customer service issues such as refunds that are requested, maybe things like snack bar credits or credit towards future memberships, et cetera. Just some things we can come up with between now and then if we deal with any customer service issues. So we don't have to tell those folks, well, let's, we have to wait till our next meeting. So I'm just asking for a little leeway uh, to work with the director of recreation um, in accommodating customers who wanna be accommodated as a result of this. Otherwise that will conclude my report on this topic and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gimes. Um, per your request, I'll open the floor to my colleagues to provide you with some thoughts in regards to this um, development. Uh, Mr. Limbick, I, I'll yield to you as the uh, liaison to get your thoughts, if, if I may. It's just, you know, the, the frustration is that, you know, the fact that we saw this coming from so far away uh, it is, and you know, and, and just still couldn't do anything to prevent it is what's so frustrating. Um, you know, given, given the caution we were given by our, our township council at the last meeting, I don't think I'm going to say much further, uh, but, um, you know, this is, it's, it's, very frustrating that you know we started this work last fall, um, you know with a uh, you know with you know with a contract that said we were going to be done in early May, uh, you know, and so we could open by Memorial Day, and we you know to be safe push that back to Father's Day, uh, and now we we can open this weekend, um, and. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of us know how difficult it's been to, you know, to even just try to maintain members, uh, you know, particularly given the environment we're in, uh, and to, to keep the pool running, uh, you know, to, to break even is really a challenge. Uh, and this is, is not going to make that challenge uh, any easier. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Thank you, Mr. Lindbrick. Um, so Mr. Dimes, you're looking for some guys in terms of residents or pool members reaching out regarding a truncated season. Um, have we, I don't have, obviously on the feed, I don't know the feeds in front of me, but um, I believe that you can buy um, a pass, you know, for, I think it was August 1st to the rest of the summer, like a truncated pass. I think we have to probably take, the, you know, take this offline and, and, and pull some of the data to see what that looks like. Um, and I, I'd rather not spitball it, if you will, at this moment. Um, but I'll continue to yield the floor open to my colleagues or any initial thoughts um, to assist with your dimes as we kind of explore, um, you know, some of the the uh, response that we may get from uh, the pool membership community regarding this delay. Yeah, and Mr. Mayor, we actually didn't offer August only uh, this year. You know, that's something we had offered in previous years. And my understanding is this year we did actually didn't offer that as a membership option in part because we were opening, you know, already opening later than expected. Uh, you know, and, and just, uh, you know, for folks that don't have the, the usual, the background of what we'd usually do, we would normally starting Memorial Day weekend be open weekends only until Father's Day weekend, this upcoming weekend. After that is when we would start being open um, on weekdays as well. And, you know, in the beginning for the first couple of, while school was still in session, we would start opening later in the day um, you know, just, you know, in the, you know, late afternoon and evening hours. And then, uh, once school was out is when we'd start being open, 
uh, for the regular hours, you know, through the end of the summer, through Labor Day. Um, but I, I sort of, I, I agree with the mayor. I think that, um, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I, a law professor of mine, you know, cautioned, you know, never do arithmetic in public. And I, I think uh, that's sort of what we'd be doing here if, if we were trying to figure out what the discount should be, um, you know, or, or you know, or, or what type of incentives we should offer, or um, uh, you know. So I, I think that's maybe a discussion that we should have, and I, I would want uh, Ms. Mancuso and her staff, you know, who would, who would be closest to this issue, to be a part of that discussion. So I think that's something that that we could discuss. Um, and, um, you know, and, and sort of see with what, you know, what we deal with. Uh, but, you know, hopefully the, hopefully the delay will, uh, will, be, will be brief. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the, the shorter the delay, the fewer customer service issues we're going to have to deal with. Right. So, Mr. Dimes, you know, what we can do is we ought to take this offline or have a breakout and I agree with, with Mr. Limbrick, getting your department heads involved that are closely part of this process. And then we can come back as a committee and have a discussion and, you know, talk about the next, uh, the next meeting for sure. Um, so I think we should table this at this point. Yeah, Mayor, may I just oh. make a comment? Mr. Mr. Duluth, uh, yes. I, I did a site visit there today and I just want to, uh, say that our DPW, we had about half of our DPW employees at the pool today, working on various projects, the, putting the concrete down for the, um, the tanks that are coming in, moving soil out so that the sod can be placed, painting, cleaning. Um, so we've really put a lot of effort on the town side. Uh, our supervisor, public works supervisor, Mr. Riccardi, He's almost there all the time. Ms. Mancuso was there. I mean, people are really there trying to get this open. And it is, um, you know, we're almost there. We have to, and I think, you know, what's important here is that we can't do this transfer until it's absolutely, everything's in place because that's on the owner, that's on the contractor. And that's, and before we can take ownership of that, that's all gotta be done. Um, I would suggest that, you know, we have a committee, it's the Recreation and Human Services Committee. They should meet this week with Mr. Jimes and Ms. Mancuso and, and Mr. Kittner and figure this out and come back to us with uh, recommendations uh, or resolve it between, you know, let's hope it, that this gets resolved before our next meeting, July 6th. Well, that's what I was gonna say, because if we need to move forward and open as soon as possible, we can't wait for a July 6th meeting. Right. So I think your committee should meet with these folks and get things, whatever you need to do, get them done. Ms. Adams, is that feasible for you to meet with your committee toward into this week? Yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm available. Yeah, and I, I would just echo what Mr. DeLuca said that, you know, my, my disappointment before, I, I certainly didn't mean to be directing that disappointment uh, at anyone on our staff. I would echo what Mr. Jimes has said that, uh, our departments, both our Department of Public Works and our Recreation and Cultural Affairs, you know, they've gone above and beyond. You know, we've we have done stuff that uh, it was certainly our understanding from the contract that was going to be done by the contractor. But in order to get this job done to try to open on time, uh, you know, there have been heroic efforts undertaken, uh, particularly by some of our DPW folks to try to get this work done. Uh, you know, just to try to try to get this pool open. Uh, so, you know, it certainly has not been for, for lack of, uh, of sweat and, uh, and hard work by our folks, but the contractor just hasn't done the work that, uh, that was in the contract for them to do in the time they were supposed to do it. So, uh, that's something we'll have to deal with. Yeah. And, and for the record, Mr. Lindbergh, I didn't see your comments as and that way, just so just to clarify that, and uh, I'm glad Mr. Duluka went out there today. I spoke with Mr. Riccardi this weekend. And he said it's he called it pool day every day, so so he was out there again today. So, um, so yeah, I think that's the next appropriate step, Mr. Daffis. Um, I'll yield the floor to you, Mayor. I just want to check in with Mr. Jimes here because I don't think we've answered his question, Mr. Jimes. You you requested guidance. Uh, you, you requested that we empower you with some authority to uh, 
work with the committee and work with the community services director to deal with customer service issues, which after this announcement this evening, presumably could start coming into you as early as tomorrow morning. Um, do you feel like you have that guidance or are you still unclear? If there's a meeting this week, you know, with the committee and obviously myself and Ms. Mancuso would be on that meeting, I I'd be okay with that. I okay. guess the main thing would be is, you know, if anybody was asking just for a full blown, you know, refund, but otherwise, if there's kind of any mathematical stuff that needs to be done just to temporarily accommodate, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with the meeting this week. That won't bother us. And I think Mr. Jimes, you know, uh, obviously working with Ms. Adams' committee, uh, and again, it's his, uh, Ms. Adams is a chairperson, but obviously coming up with various scenarios um, to, to, to leverage. So, um, but we'll yield it to you and Ms. Adams and any other department heads. Um, and we also have, to, we'll do a breakout and talk about this through our email. And, so, uh, Mr. Desidero, do we need um, a, a resolution or a motion from the township committee to give that leeway to Recreation and Human Services to work with um, Mr. Jimes and relevant staff to come up with a new schedule, a fee schedule. You're muted. I think that's a good idea. And then we could confirm it on July 6th if in fact there are some changes. So a motion, a motion to give that authority to Ms. Adams and her committee. I, I move that we give authority to Ms. Adams, Mr. Jimes to uh, to brainstorm and create a uh, a new fee schedule. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Britson, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGeehee? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Jimes, I guess we will, uh, anything else to report? Does that conclude your report for this evening? Other than welcoming our new assistant attached to the ministry, <laughs> we started yesterday. Welcome, Bailey, and uh, Ms. Barnett, that uh, concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Jimes. Any additional questions for Mr. Jimes at this time? Hearing none, we'll move on uh, and hear a report from our township attorney, Mr. Desiderio. Thank you, Mayor. I have actually no report, but I just want to just wish uh, Mr. Mikulowski luck on his new endeavors. I believe this is his last meeting. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. Uh, and I welcome Ms. Barnett also and look forward to meeting him. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. Are there any questions for Mr. Desiderio? Yeah, okay. Mr. Mikulowski appeared suddenly. <laughs> He's always with us. <laughs> He looks kind of like a ghost in the dark. Uh, in a dark, <laughs> empty apartment as I wait to uh, move out next week. <laughs> Hopefully you got your pizza. There you go. <laughs> All right. Hearing uh, no questions from Mr. Desiderio, we'll now move on to our township clerk, Ms. Fritzen. Thanks, Mayor. Just a couple of things. Um, I was uh, just report that three of the resolutions on the consent agenda uh, resolutions 178, 179, and 180 are all uh, the renewals of all of our ABC licensees in town for the year uh, 2021 through 2022. And I would encourage the uh, governing body to pass those resolutions. Uh, you receive reports of departments and I don't uh, consider anything monumental. We've certainly had separate hearings in the past, but we don't seem to require one this year. So again, I would encourage you to um, vote those through tonight. Um, the other item is just to report on uh, the primary election that was held on uh, June 8th. And um, we had uh, uh, new scanners and uh, low voter turnout. And I guess um, in the scheme of things, having lower voter turnout for uh, your first time with um, the new scanners and a primary election with very few uh, uh, contests um, that worked out well. Um, I wanna say thank you to all of the departments that assisted. Uh, we were extremely successful. Things always seemed to start out rocky at 6 a.m. Uh, till about seven and then things settled down. But um, again, I certainly couldn't do it without um, 
Mr. DeLuca in the OEM and the walkthroughs that we had and the pre-planning and uh, again, all the departments that assist um, me time after time with our elections, both primary and general. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fritz, and, and job well done as always. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions for Ms. Fritz? Mr. Uh, Daphis. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Ritson, uh, I just wanted to thank you for your hard work with the elections. Uh, again, uh, you always knock it out of the park, you and your, and your team uh, and our poll workers, uh, despite the challenges this time with the new machines and uh, uh, some of the other things that we had to deal with. Let's just leave it at that. Um, I'm sure that you have received feedback from poll workers, from voters, from our district leaders uh, and other uh, observants throughout the day on, on election day of some issues that were widely reported inconsistencies um, in using the scanner as it related to some privacy issues. In some places, the folders were being used or they weren't being used. Um, some confusion uh, in general and uh, you know, lack of sufficient training for some of our poll workers. And I presume that you are going to be reporting, if you haven't already, all of this back to the county uh, so that they have that feedback so that we can do better uh, in the general. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Daphis, we've already had one county meeting um, in, since the election. And uh, I don't think Maplewood did half bad when I hear some of the horror stories from my... Uh, uh, neighboring township clerks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Daphis. Any any quite any more further questions for Ms. Fritzman? All right. Hearing none, we'll now move on to agenda item number 15, reports from elected officials. We will first hear from Mr. Daphis. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I have a few things, I'll go quickly. Uh, the Community Board on Police, we put together a working group similar to the working group we had uh, when we first put the, the board together itself. Uh, the working group will continue working on the proposed charter revisions. Um, and I think we're, we're making some good progress and hope to be able to roll that out soon. Our community fridge, uh, we've had some delays, uh, delays from PSCNG in terms of electrical uh, connections at, uh, at our location. I understand that that has been resolved uh, just a couple days ago actually, and we should be uh, back on schedule for a launch uh, soon. Uh, our composting pilot is gonna happen with Java's. I'm really excited about that. It's going to be a, a pilot, so only a few subscribers uh, starting September 1st. Mr. Jo Mr. Jimes and Mr. Desideri have been working diligently on all of the, the legal documentation and other documentation, um, and we are going to uh, go into the next phase now, which is working on marketing and getting our 55 or so subscribers. More on that soon. Uh, from our senior advisory committee, I received a recommendation. I was hoping to get this on the agenda this evening, but it didn't make it. That's okay. We'll discuss it next time. Uh, a very non-controversial request to amend, to consider amending our ordinance so that uh, our social worker that we now share, Carol Berman with South Orange, be a liaison uh, to the, the committee. Obviously, Carol is working with a lot of our older adults and it makes a lot of sense. Currently, what we have is the human services coordinator. Um, and again, as I've stated before, our human services coordinator works with our older adults who are existing um, uh, recipients of assistance through the county and the state. So that's not a lot of our, uh, our seniors and older adults through the committee. So I will bring that up for discussion next time and, and we can make that happen. Um, Maplewood Village. Um, I'm gonna say only this and hopefully in the next week or two, we can have a major announcement. Um, 
But let's just say for now that negotiations with new grocers at the former King's location uh, have really expanded and been very substantive and we're getting very close. That's all I'm going to say for now. Um, the Maplewood Village Alliance is meeting this evening uh, when they're going to adopt new bylaws. I'll report back uh, on those and, and how that may affect some things, if at all. Um, and I have asked the, the Village Alliance over the course of the next couple of months to begin soliciting feedback from merchants and consumers um, regarding uh, the parklets and the pedestrian plaza uh, so that we can uh, be better informed as we decide what to do uh, moving forward after the end of this year as people return to work and as parking becomes uh, more of a need uh, in that area. As you all know, we had a successful Pride kickoff uh, last weekend. And again, this weekend, a lot of people came out. In fact, more people than we thought would. Uh, obviously people need to gather and, and be together and, and resume social contact. Um, and we definitely have seen that in our community in a very beautiful uh, fashion at all of the events that we had. Uh, people are really excited and they're very proud and we should be proud of our community because we do have a very strong uh, community. Um, and I'm excited about that. Please join us. This Thursday, the Hilton Association is doing a, a pride program and thank you, Mary, um, from the Hilton Association and the entire board for uh, hosting a, um, a panel, a discussion, nothing too heavy, how to be an LGBTQ ally. Let's talk about pronouns, what do they mean, how do we use them? Uh, it's a, a wonderful discussion and education opportunity to create more welcoming and affirming neighborhoods and relationships in our town. And on Friday night, the big block party, dance party uh, on Maplewood Avenue will occur starting at 6 p.m. and ending at 10 p.m. Uh, put your dancing shoes on and come on out and be gay <laughs> and, and, and joyous and merry because we need a little more joy right now. Um, and next week, we're going to have a discussion, a very serious discussion uh, with the filmmaker of the documentary Brother Outsider, which uh, documents the life of Bayard Rustin, the African-American uh, gay man responsible for the March on Washington, one of Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. King's trusted advisors, uh, one of the most brilliant organizers in the civil rights uh, world that we've ever known. And uh, that's going to be great. It's going to include uh, Bayard's former partner, uh, Walter Neagle. Uh, he's going to be there. And uh, we, we hope everyone to join us and, and, and get more information and knowledge about uh, Bayard Rustin. Um, when we say visibility matters, Mayor Yay. and colleagues, it really does. Um, you know, in the four years that I've been an elected representative, uh, I've never received requests to speak about pride uh, to our neighboring communities as I have this year. It must be pandemic related, post pandemic people coming out and wanting to raise the flag. But seriously, there are communities that are raising the pride flag this year that have never, ever done that. Um, you know, one good example is Cedar Grove. It's a pretty big deal in Cedar Grove. Um, so, you know, it just shows how important it is to just have one person who is willing to be uh, a leader or, or someone to be courageous enough to say, let's do this, let's bring community together um, and let's get to know each other better uh, for other communities to realize the need to do it. So I, I just want you to know that Maplewood is really uh, spreading the rainbow far and wide um, and we should be proud of that. We really should be proud of our community as a whole uh, because we're doing that on social justice issues as well. And, and pride is a social justice issue. It, it truly is. Um, we had a, speaking of pride, a, a very successful equality march or walk rather in Montclair this past weekend. Uh, a, a lot of elected representatives were there, including our, our great ally, the governor himself, and uh, 
you know, again, Maplewood was represented, Maplewood was talked about, Maplewood is on the map. And I'm very proud of that. And I never take that for granted. And I do whatever I can to put our town first. So um, planning board, planning board, uh, as it relates to our master plan redo, uh, we had our subcommittee first meeting the other night. Uh, I forget what night it is, last night actually it was. Uh, and we had some really good initial discussion about some of our priorities and, you know, some of the elements that go into this thing and, and, the, and the long work, the marathon that it is uh, going forward through the end of the year and probably uh, most of next year as well. And I'm going to add with some, I'm going to end rather with some numbers about our vaccinations. Uh, we had two vax clinics today, pop-up clinics, one at DHART and one at the Woodland, where we, will, we were able to vaccinate 53 people who had not been vaccinated before, and some of them were local, so we should be proud of that. Uh, I want to really salute all of our public health officers, our nurses, uh, our public health director, Candace Davenport and her team, and all of the amazing volunteers who took it upon themselves to be part of the vaccination effort. I'm talking about our community volunteers or community corps out there who, corps out there who, who just took it upon themselves to reach out and make sure that people were being vaccinated, not just in Maplewood, but in the surrounding area. Uh, people like Sally Unsworth, and uh, her friend Allison and the amazing team that they put together, uh, making calls and knocking on doors and making sure people had the information they needed and the confidence they needed to become vaccinated. Um, 65 and over, we are at 89% fully vaccinated. Uh, we have a potential of being at 99% uh, if you add the 10% of first doses only. Uh, 18 and over, we are at 73% fully vaccinated. Uh, another 10% first dosers, putting us closer to 83%. 12 and over, uh, we are 69% uh, fully vaccinated. I mean, 12 and over is a recent thing, just a few weeks in, and already we're at 69%. We really should be proud of that. 12% uh, first dose for a potential total of 81% for 12 and over only. Uh, we are really, really knocking it out of the park. And again, it's a team effort, it's a community effort. And I really want to salute Sally, Allison, and uh, some of our great community leaders and volunteers who have been part of this effort. That is my report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daffis. And if I may add to your report, that number you mentioned, 81%, is understand that's an amazing number in terms of 12 plus because right now the county is at 63 percent so we're indexing almost 20 points over the county so let's just recognize where we are versus our other uh 20 uh, municipalities uh, in, in the county and then also uh i attended the pride parade on on uh, pride picnic on sunday and i just want to say that uh, Mr. Daffis had some very compelling words for the um, for the community, uh, which I hope resonated for those who are in attendance. Um, it was um, really focusing on the balance within uh, within the LGBTQ community, especially related to people of color. And I really appreciate his candid uh, words to the community um, um, on Sunday. So, thank you, Mr. Daffis. Uh, we'll now hear from Mr. Limbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a few items for me tonight. Uh, I want to start uh, with the Public Safety Committee. Um, you know, I, I won't go through, um, you know, the, the bulk of last Wednesday's Public Safety Committee, committee was, as usual, spent uh, going through the, the reports uh, from the, the April monthly. We, you know, we, for those who don't attend Public Safety Committees, we usually go through the um, you know, the last full month uh, of reports. So, you know, in, in June, we would talk about April, uh, but, you know, for both police and fire, there were, there were more pressing events to discuss. Uh, obviously, uh, in the police portion of the report, we discussed, um, you know, the terrible uh, events that had occurred uh, in Underhill Field. Uh, we received a report at that point 
uh, from Deputy Chief Sally um, on the latest in the investigation. You know, I, I won't repeat that. Uh, we heard earlier this evening from Chief Duvall, uh, you know, particularly updating us uh, about the reward that's now being offered for information that, that might lead uh, to, uh, you know, the authorities uh, to you know, assist in their investigation, um, and um, you know, our fire department, uh, as you heard earlier tonight, um, we we heard from Chief Weber uh, as he uh, as he prepares to transition to retirement, uh, and I'll just note that uh, one of the items on our consent agenda tonight uh, is Resolution 186-21, where uh, Deputy Chief uh, Chris Ariema uh, will be appointed as the interim uh, acting chief uh, of the fire department, uh, and he'll be uh, assuming that role at the end of this month uh, upon Chief Weber's retirement. Uh, so, you know, as, as Chief Weber mentioned, uh, there's a lot of great leadership in addition to Chief Weber uh, at the uh, in the Maplewood Fire Department. And uh, Deputy Chief Ariam is certainly uh, part of that great group. Um, just a few other brief items. I want to join uh, Deputy Mayor Dathis uh, in thanking and congratulating Ms. Fritzen and her team uh, for running a great election day uh, as usual. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, the, you know, Liz can't bring the folks out to vote. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the small turnout was, uh, was a lot of things we can talk about politically and practically why turnout was low. Uh, but uh, despite a lot of the obstacles, including new voting machines and, uh, and weather and, and other issues, uh, Ms. Fritzen and her team did a great job as usual. And I know they're going to take uh, the experience they had uh, last Tuesday and, and take that uh, to run an even better and smoother uh, election come this November when we obviously hope and expect the turnout's going to be uh, much higher for the general election. So thank you, Ms. Fritzen, and, and please convey our appreciation to your team. Um, and uh, my last two notes uh, are also uh, of, a, uh, of a positive note. Uh, since this is our last meeting uh, in June, I want to thank uh, and congratulate Mr. Michalowski. Uh, Glenn, it has been uh, a great few years. Uh, it has really been a pleasure working with you. Uh, I wanna thank you for all the times you've, uh, you've guided me through uh, IT issues and, and other issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, particularly during uh, the pandemic, uh, I don't know how, you know, I, I honestly don't know how uh, the township would have would have functioned uh, without your patience, without your expertise. Uh, you know, you really got us through some very difficult times. Um, and I, I know that uh, whatever you do next, uh, you're going to bring your, you know, your your good humor, uh, your professionalism uh, and your your sense of public service. Uh, to uh, to Maine and uh, you know the the community you serve next, uh, whether it be the public or or a company or or what, you know wh whoever you serve next is going to be uh, very lucky to have you uh, and uh, and we wish you all the best and uh, you'll you you'll certainly be uh, be well remembered here in Maplewood. So uh, thank you uh, and uh, finally. Uh, for all the folks who are going to be graduating uh, next week, uh, whether it be our kindergartners, all our elementary school students moving on to middle school, uh, our middle schoolers who are going to be moving on to high school, and particularly our Columbia High School students, uh, you, you all have made it through uh, some, some very interesting times. Uh, it's a, it's a known as an, as an old Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. and. And uh, you all have uh, have have come of age and uh, and are graduating at interesting times, but uh, but you've made it through and you're moving on to the next stage. And particularly uh, for those at Columbia High School, uh, we congratulate you and uh, we wish you well. 
uh, on uh, on the next challenge, whether it's college or uh, or work or whatever comes next. Um, and uh, we're rooting for you. And Mr. Mayor, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Limbrick. Um, we'll now hear from Mr. DeLuca. I'll say it again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so let me just uh, thank Glenn for his time here and helping us through uh, a number of projects, working on the farmer's market, the Wi-Fi project, and a number of other things. I, I chatted with him before. I was asking him if he could help us with IT go after July uh, because we'll, we'll always need you. We're going to find you somewhere. Um, just to piggyback on the uh, vaccination today, I want to give a shout out to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, when I visited the site at the community center at DeHart Park, they were there giving out water and they had cookies. They even had free books from Words. Uh, people were taking books and cookies from Abel Baker and BCB Bank was there. Gary Jones was there. Um, it was really great. And uh, so and it was terrific to see the, our facility being used that way. I want to um, just point out tonight on our consent agenda, resolution 191-21, we're gonna be accepting a donation from the Friends of the Abrams. I wanted to give you a little background. We, uh, we received a, a letter, uh, Ms. Mancuso received a letter from the Friends uh, for a $2,000 contribution from the Kathy and Andy Abrams uh, for, to fund outdoor musical performances in our town. And um, Kathy and Andy were longtime residents. Kathy served as Mrs. Claus during um, Christmas time in the village and owned a store on Baker Street. And they were just so happy. They loved the town and um, they wanted to make a contribution. So we'll be accepting that $2,000. Uh, the other th kind of uh, message I wanted to share with you all was from the Barone family. And you know, we do a lot of moments of silence for people who have been involved in civic life. <clears throat> and and, and uh, Ed Barone was a member of the township committee and he was our municipal judge. I attended the wake, I knew Ed, I had attended the wake. And um, I got a note from uh, Lillian Barone, his wife, just thanking us, saying Ed loved Maplewood and he wanted to thank every member, she wanted to thank every member of the township committee for the comments uh, you made mayor and also for the bunting uh, and Ms. Fritzen for the bunting that we put on the township uh, um, column. So again, you know, you, sometimes you do these things, you don't know the repercussions, but this was a real, made a real impact on the Barone family. And lastly, uh, just to give you an update on the electric vehicles, uh, this comes out of the Engineering Public Works and Planning Committee. We uh, submitted an app, a funding application to the state a while back for a number of different um, locations that we wanted to install EV stations. Uh, we will be getting some of that funding. It's a little unclear how much and um, where locations, but we do know that one of the locations will be in town hall. And we're looking to put a bank of EV chargers uh, along that strip of backyards that are to the right of the parking lot. So that's what I was asking about the police car because that might be a location where the ch car could charge. Um, we're gonna find out where the other funding might be uh, usable. Um, and this funding uh, is in addition to what we might be getting from Audi. Uh, that's a separate operation. So we're, we're moving in the direction that we wanna move and that's to be uh, ready for EV cars. And um, again, once we work out the details with the state, we'll be moving forward with that project. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. And I also want to thank you for recognizing the chamber as a, as a liaison to it. I, I want to say that Claudine and Diana, they were, um, Mr. DeLuca was at the heart and I went to the Woodland and they went to both. We did 21 at the Woodland and then the 32 at the heart. And they were there both times. It's a full day, three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon at the heart. So, um, you know, that was great to have them as part of that program as well. Um, Ms. Adams. Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple things. Uh, we'll be sending out 
um, in the next couple of days from the township and from uh, the green team will also be circulating and anyone who can circulate it is the um, subcommittee, uh, the joint committee with South Orange on the recycling and garbage and all that stuff we're trying to work on. Um, it's a survey for the residents of both towns. Um, it'll only take you about two minutes to fill it out. It's online and um, I, I asked the administrator and um, to get that out there as soon as possible and far and wide. So the more people who answer, the more guidance we'll have on, on what people might be willing to do with regard to composting or, you know, uh, separating, you know, dual stream recycling, things like that. So we just, we really need this information. This is um, a thankless issue right now as far as, and, and, and a not a sustainable one. Um, the cost to our taxpayers for our recycling. And then on top of that, their own private haulers for garbage. Um, we need to do something and if we, to the extent that we can, and it's not an easy thing in New Jersey. So, you know, we're doing our best to try to hash through a lot of information in a pretty short period of time and working with South Orange and this consultant, Zero Waste Consultants, to try to get some guidance and some uh, on roads that we could take to um, better for the environment and better for our tax dollars. So that's going to be going out. I'd ask everyone to look for that and spread it share it on social media, email it to people. Um, also, um, I wanted to just, oh, let people know there's a progressive pride flag raising this Saturday at 1 p.m. at the South Orange Elks. Um, everyone is welcome. Um, that's at one o'clock at the Elks across from Our Lady of Sorrows on Prospect Street. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna um, thank Glenn and I'll miss you. I'll probably um, text you for my password. <laughs> <laughs> I told Committeeman DeLuca, I go, you, you and I. <laughs> so. You got that. <laughs> that makes three of us. I'm going to do the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't get on that iPad. So when I go using it again, I don't know what's happening there. So get ready, Bailey. You're going to need to like pick up some slack there with that stuff so um anyway good luck to you glenn and it's been a real pleasure working with you and thank you for all you've contributed to us and to our town thank you i'll save some remarks for the end but thank you that's all i have man thank you Ms. adams uh, just a few items uh first i want to recognize uh one of our small business owners we did a ribbon cutting on sunday uh, kind of boss lady uh, on Highland. She, uh, that's okay, dude, I got you. Um, you know, she had a, she's uh, opened up a new CBD uh, spot. Uh, very nice, very charming spot and, you know, and very focused on being successful. So shout out to her and her team. It was a very nice event. I also uh, have to give a shout out to our CHS musical, uh, Matilda, for those who had opportunity to be out there on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, six o'clock on Floods Hill. It was amazing, unbelievable. Uh, you know, the, the, the volunteers, uh, everyone, uh, Bethany Pettigrew, uh, the crew, uh, the lighting, uh, the volunteers from uh, the CHS uh, Machisma, as well as uh, the volunteers from Midnight Madness. We had a thousand, over a thousand people on Sunday night, Saturday night. I wasn't there Friday night and Thursday was nearly a thousand people. And the weather was beautiful. It was, a, it was just a, just, you know, a fitting in for uh, these young people who basically waited 20 months for that weekend, 20 months. Because if you don't remember, they, they were supposed to open that first weekend. We called a state of emergency uh, that Thursday evening and they were supposed to open up that next night. So uh, a lot of tears that day. And, and now we had lots of, Lots of joy this weekend. Um, I also want to uh, um, talk about uh, even the balance that we have, and I was alluding to it a little bit with Mr. Daffis's remarks, and that is even on, on, uh, amongst the midst of our wonderful Pride Month, uh, we have now commenced starting this past Sunday, our Juneteenth week. Uh, you know, Mapsville Youth uh, came to us, coalition came to us and said, do better, uh, Maplewood. You know, you're doing fireworks for the 4th of July. You're always supporting Independence Day. But what about the true Independence Day, the Liberation Day, you know, of, of Black Americans in 1865 in Texas? And so uh, 
we listened to that and we said, you know, we're going to we're going to do something about that. We're not going to do one day, which is this Saturday coming up, but we're going to do a whole week. We're going to celebrate this day of liberation. You know, um, it's really our country's other Independence Day, uh, but also very important. So uh, we took that initiative and we really started to get the ball rolling, um, which was excellent. Uh, we started on Sunday um, and on Sunday, what we did is we had our uh, celebration of black uh, music, poetry and art uh, it was wonderful. We had Greg Buford and his team out there. We had all these black merchants from Maplewood and South Orange surrounding community. Little rain, but didn't stop us. We had dancing. We had spoken word by Eric Shorter, who actually spoke in our public remarks earlier, uh, and also uh, Huru Stewart, who is a, a well-renowned uh, poet and also a teacher at Jefferson High School, a great teacher. So that was a wonderful event. And then yesterday, I was joined by uh, Mr. DeLuca and Mr. Daffis as we uh, raised the Juneteenth flag in South Orange uh, with uh, Village President Collum and her colleagues and NAACP and Terry Richardson and many other dignitaries, Thayer Joshua, Khadijah White. It was uh, Dr. Khadijah White, it was really great. And so if you go to South Orange uh, drive through for the next couple of days, uh, you'll see not only just the pride flag, but you'll see the Juneteenth flag. And that's that beautiful balance that we're looking for. Um, and so just also, as I'll stop sharing my screen for a second here, um, there are also other events that are gonna be happening um, throughout uh, this week as well. And so um, tomorrow evening, um, I will be joined by fellow mayors, Ross Baraka, we're for the Ross Baraka, uh, as well as Michelle Delafort and Ted Green. We're gonna talk about black mayors discuss June, Juneteenth. So I have it here on, on the page, so you can see it. So please come on out and, uh, and hear uh, a really great talk. Uh, Trustee Summer Jones is going to be our moderator. And so it should be a very enlightening conversation. And that's tomorrow night at 7.30. And then uh, Juneteenth itself, a couple of things I wanna highlight. So our Mapsville Youth Coalition is doing a great job. So you see at the Jefferson Schoolyard, there'll be events. Our Duran Hinnon group, uh, it's gonna have a wonderful event from 11 to four. Uh, to Ms. Adams' point, uh, it's a lot to do. So uh, I will be at the Elks at one, which will be great. And so, uh, so spend some time there, then run over there. And then that evening we will conclude at Floods Hill with music, uh, dancing, there'll be a beer garden uh, and a very special surprise when it gets dark at Floods Hill on Saturday night. So please come out and enjoy a Juneteenth the way it should be celebrated as our Independence Day. Um, and my final uh, comment or uh, 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 point is for uh, Mr. Mikulowski. And that is that, uh, Glenn, thank you. Um, we joke about your IT skills and, you know, and, and, you know, how we can't do anything without you. But the fact of the matter is um, we ask you to jump and you say how high. You just always have risen, raised to the occasion to help us, all five of us. Um, doesn't matter when, you know, you're, you've always been accessible uh, you, and you've always, uh, show passion in what you do. And, and for me, I know we've had some great conversations about, you know, the outdoors and biking and things like that, uh, but you've been the constant professional, uh, someone that we can always look to and turn to and appreciate being part of our team. So um, I wish you, as we all do nothing but the best, um, you are amazing and we will be here for you when you need a reference or anything like that, whatever your, your next steps are, but enjoy the, the beautiful uh, uh, state of Maine in regards to, uh, to the family. And um, thank you again. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mayor. You ben, might want to say I yield the floor to you. When gets the last words? I just want to say it's, it's been a privilege and an honor to serve in such an important position. And just to highlight that, really to be a part of a community that sees the value in developing people in roles like this. It's not very common to get an opportunity like this. And I just want you to know, you know, how important it was to me and to work with, you know, all the residents, the talented staff, the volunteers, the committee members, there's such a large wealth of institutional knowledge and stuff that, you know, I've, I've taken in over the last two and a half years and it will be invaluable as I take it to me to Maine and bring a little bit of Jersey to Maine because, you know, this is my home and I will miss it. And, uh, 
you know, I just look forward to this next exciting chapter with my wife and, you know, her new career in Fort Smith. So, you know, um, I look forward to it. It's going to be exciting. Again, I will, I will miss all of you. I'll miss the residents and the projects that, you know, I've been proud to work on and things that I've seen since their inception and, you know, to their finish. And, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, still involved from afar, keeping an eye on everything because, you know, this is still my home and I, you know, I won't forget it or the time I've spent here. So thank you. And I'll be in the conference room till the 25th. I look forward to connecting with everybody individually and, you know, talking about our experiences and, you know, in, enjoy seeing you before I leave. Take care. Thank you, Glenn. Mayor, if I may just make a comment, uh, I was remiss earlier during my report. Um, Glenn, I, I want to say thank you. Um, your assistance in the last three months has been extraordinary. Um, you're obviously a benefit to this community and you're a benefit to the profession at large. And if you stay in the public sector, the public sector will be better served. Uh, you bring a dedication and a commitment and a, length and a base of knowledge that is needed in this field. Um, and you're just part of a great team here and you're part of a great team in this profession. So I'm sure at national conferences at some point, our paths will cross again if you stay in the field. And I look forward to that. I could not have um, you know, done what I've done the first few months without your assistance. So thank you again. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you in Portland in October. Send us lobsters. <laughs> Yes. Agreed. Be good by the time they get here. <laughs> Put them on ice. Ice. <laughs> ice. Ice. Them them down. We'll, we'll pay for the ice. You pay for the lobsters, Glenn. Yeah. Glenn, uh, Ms. Milowski, thank you so much. All right. We're now going to move on in our agenda. We're on agenda item number 16. Our first are our four discussion items. Uh, this one I will lead, and this is in regards. Uh, to um, the possibility of alcohol being uh, served um, at the Maplecrest Park and the Spring Cloud Gazebo for uh, various events. So uh, as we know, as a township committee, an event application came in for an outdoor family event uh, with uh, food vendors and, and music uh, at the Spring Cloud Gazebo. Uh, it is a, a request for beer garden uh, from our nonprofit partner, the Danny Ives Foundation is part of it. It's a MAPSO Funk Fest. Uh, it's in August, end of August. And, um, and I know that the request was to, um, you know, to serve um, alcohol um, in a beer garden event. And I know that our ordinance, um, which was provided to the TC, uh, and I think it was number C, 79.1-C says the township of Maplewood made by resolution of the township of the Maplewood Township Committee permit the distribution and consumption of beer and wine within an enclosed area with a regu regulated entrance that is which is uh, approved and used by the at Maplewood Municipal Park upon securing any license required by law, including the ABC. So my question to the committee is why not Maple Crest Park and why not uh, the Springfield, uh, you know, the casebo? Why sh can we not have that balance? So as people have events, for example, the rim party has a, traditionally has a, a rim party event in the fall. So I just wanted to have a conversation and see if we're open to expanding this to provide opportunity for those who want to have their events, not necessarily in a Memorial Park, like a Maplewood stock, which we all love, but like a rent party in Maplecrest Park or gazebo like the Danny Ice Foundation, how can we work to get that possible so there's that balance? So I yield the floor for the discussion. So I'll start. Uh, you know, we changed this in 2019 and all of us voted for this, this, uh, this regulation. And uh, I read the minutes and Mr. Daffis raised the issue of equity and, and uh, maybe we should include Maple Crest Park. I was pretty uh, adamant against it at the time. Um, and I thought there was a difference between Memorial Park and Maple Crest Park. Maple Crest Park has a lot of, uh, it's a lot closer to the residential community, whereas Memorial Park really doesn't have um, a residential community surrounding it. Uh, but I've changed my mind and I'm willing to amend the ordinance to include Maple Crest Park. Um, I would prefer not to include the gazebo, but have the have any beer garden be in the park because the gazebo is a, it, it's a very small area. And the way we have it written is that 
the the beer garden has to be among a you know a bigger event and i'm a little concerned that the that a that a um just a gazebo event could be a small event with a beer garden it's just a technicality if you have it in the park it still could be used you close off tuscan go back and forth but i would be willing to change the ordinance change my mind from two years ago to include maple crest park thank you mr deluca I, um, that is, I see your hand raised. Uh, I was for it back then, and, and I'm for it now, and I agree with uh, Mr. DeLuca's comments. Um, we know, for instance, when we do the uh, the concerts at the gazebo, uh, we, we get a lot of complaints uh, about, you know, the music, whatever the music is, whether it's jazz, whether it's R&B or something else, um, you know, the noise does affect uh, the apartment residents right across the street. So um, so the gazebo is a little trickier, but yes, to Maplecrest Park, let's do it. Thank you, Mr. Dapas. Uh, Ms. Adams. Yeah, I'm fine with it as I was a couple of years ago, um, but I agree the gazebo is too small an area because we require that it be, you know, the beer garden or beer and wine garden be fenced off with one entrance con controlled and that would take up most of that area <laughs> if you want to do it so um, and I don't think it should be an exclusive thing and if you did it by the gazebo it would basically be all you could do by the gazebo is have a beer garden so um, yeah so I'm fine with Maple Crest. Thank you Ms. Adams. Uh, Mr. Limber? Yeah I mean I, at the risk of, of just adding to the chorus I, I uh, for the reasons others have stated I'm in agreement uh, that it makes sense to expand uh, to Maple Crest, uh, similar to how we do it in Memorial, uh, but I'd be opposed uh, to the gazebo for the same reason I'd be opposed to any number of other smaller public spaces uh, in the township. I, I think Maple Crest has, uh, has the footprint that's, that's big enough uh, to do it. Um, you know, I, I think we could uh, particularly, you know, require that it be done. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do it in one of sort of the corners or the extremes of the park uh, that would be right directly across from a residential area. Uh, but I think the park is large enough, uh, you know, and I, I think you and I have both been to, you know, where rent, you know, like rent party does like their, you know, in the fall, like their, uh, their family picnic, you know, and, and other times where you're going to have an event, you sort of do it closer to the middle of the park, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, setting it up there uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I think as, you know, as long as it was somewhere central in the park, um, away from the residential area, I would, I would support that. Uh, I wouldn't support it in the gazebo or uh, sort of one of the residential outlying areas of the park. Uh, that, that's my position. Thank you, Mr. Lembrick. So, Mr. Desiderio, uh, uh, we could do this break uh, breakout and uh, maybe uh, work on this together and come back to the committee with something. Got it, Mayor. I already got it noted. Awesome. Thank can, you. Can I can I just ask a procedural question? Uh, is it possible because this is coming up in August, right? Yes, it is. Is it possible, Mr. Desiderio, that we could, uh, uh, by resolution, allow this? so that we could give some certainty to the group planning it and then work on the ordinance on, on a parallel move because I'm concerned that if we wait until July 20th to have a final ordinance that doesn't give them much time to do their planning and remember um I'm sorry Mr. Desdere the the way it works and you know to Mr. Limbrick's point they have to come back. They have to come before us and make a and make a request as to where it's going to be. We have to approve that lo location. Not only do we have to approve the the site, but we have to. We, I mean the uh, the event. But we have to approve the location. So, I guess the question to Mr. Desiderio is: Can we expedite this through a resolution if they come to the next meeting? The answer is yes, but you realize that by virtue of the ordinance, you have public comment. So it is not inconceivable that you can hear public comment that will change your mind. So that when this comes on for a second reading, you may, you may change whatever you're suggesting here. So the answer is yes, with the understanding that nothing you're doing here 
the passage of a resolution is not binding on the ordinance because at that point you're going to have a public hearing. Right. Okay. Understood. I understand it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. DeLuca. So, uh, Mr. Desiderio, I'll work with you on these parallel tracks uh, yep. offline. So, thank you. All right. Well, now we'll move on to discussion item number two, which is related to our Jitney services. I will yield the floor to Mr. DeLuca. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so, the Engineering, Public Works, and Planning Committee met. We're recommending Jitney service resume on Monday, September 13th, uh, which gives us the week after Labor Day and Rosh Hashanah and the start of school. We uh, agree that we should run a, a full schedule of morning and evening services on all five Jitney routes. Um, the half price effect will be in effect because that our ordinance says that that starts July 1st. Uh, the per ride rate of $2 will remain in effect. That will be cash paid in the fare box. Uh, we have plastic barriers already put up to protect the drivers. Passengers will sit side by side. We'll have no COVID limitation on the number of passengers. So we had talked a little bit about maybe only filling half the bus. We're not going to do that, but we are going to require all passengers and drivers to wear masks. Um, our big issue right now is we need a minimum of 10 drivers. We, uh, we have uh, half or less than half of that. So we're, we're in, are in the process of recruiting drivers so that we can start. Um, if for some reason we're short drivers, we'll rearrange Hilton, Maplecrest and Elmwood to try to make that happen. Uh, so I would like the township committee, I would move that the township committee approve the uh, committee's recommendation to resume Jitney service on September 13th. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Um, hearing none, Ms. Fritzen, uh, can you call a roll here? Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen, and thank you, Mr. DeLuca. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number three, which is a discussion regarding cannabis uh, in relation to our public parks. Mr. DeLuca. Thank you. So the recommendation is that in our uh, co current code, chapter 234, smoking, where we do not allow smoking in our public parks because of a health uh, concern, that we add uh, the language here in red uh, that uh, you can't smoke anything that's uh, tobacco. Uh, or, or now we would have including cannabis or other cannabis-based project uh, products, blah, 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 blah. And then we would add in the list of uh, places where we would be, smoking would be prohibited, we add Yale Corner and the Springfield Avenue gazebo. So that's the recommendation. If we're in, uh, in, in agreement with this, uh, Mr. Desiderio can draft it up and we can introduce it at our next meeting. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor, I'll just note that this was discussed at last week's Public Safety Committee meeting, uh, and Deputy Chief Sally, uh, you know, definitely uh, communicated clearly that this is something that the police would be in favor of, uh, in terms of making it very clear uh, to you know that that law enforcement, you know, if they if they encountered folks who were smoking in, in the parks or these other public areas, uh, regardless of what they were smoking, uh, that that was clearly prohibited. And he said, you know, that would give the officers the, the clarity they need around these issues uh, to address that. So uh, th this is something that would have uh, support uh, from, uh, from, you know, from the police department. Thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Um, Ms. Adams? Yeah, as long as uh, Mr. Desiderio confirms that it's not in um, contrast to whatever the state puts out as far as permissions for smoking pot, I think it's, I think it's, we're allowed to limit it, but just checking. Yeah, I'll check it, but I don't think there's any prohibition. Sure. I don't think there's a prohibition to, the, to this amendment. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Adams, and thank you, uh, Mr. Desiderio. Um, Mr. Daff, is anything to say? No, I was just going to respond that we are allowed to to do this in our parks um, without conflicting with 
the legalization and decriminalization of, of cannabis. Okay. All right. And nothing to add. We discussed the public safety, so no, nothing further to add. Uh, so I, ha I have one thing, Mayor, if I may. Mr. Mr. Lucas, as long as we're going to amend it, I'm looking at the violations, and we have the not less than and not to exceed, and we've been trying to go to specific violations. Do you have a problem if we say fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, and two hundred dollars, and make them make them firm without the others? Uh, I will open that up to uh, discussion. Any objections to Mr. Desiderio's point? No objection. All right. Hearing none. Uh, no the, objection. Okay. Good catch, Roger. Thank you. See, I'm staying awake. Yeah, yeah. you are. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Mr. Desiderio. All right. So we will uh, go ahead and retire that discussion item. And now we'll move on to uh, discussion item number four, which is uh, the hard uh, turf uh, or field study. Um, you know, I'll just be brief and then I'll yield the floor to Mr. Gimes. Uh, obviously, this has been a topic of conversation for the last couple of months. Um, and uh, Mr. Gimes moved forward as instructed by the TC to uh, provide us with this uh, robust study here. Um, and uh, it was uh, really excellent and well done. Uh, I think the takeaway is that, as we'll learn, is that, you know, the study done on the field shows that um, you know, the efforts that we've Put in place uh, in in you know over the last uh, ten plus years have not uh, provided the ROI uh, for our community as we deem them to be. Um, so I look forward to hearing more about um, you know this opportunity to um, to really just uh, I guess pivot and and do something uh, different than what we've been doing. Uh, you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. So uh, with that, I will yield the floor to Mr. Gimes uh, for more of a narrative and also for our guest consultant uh, engineer for this evening, Mr. Gimes. Thank you, Mayor. As you indicated, I you know, acted on the direction of the governing body to commission you know, this report proposal and supporting documentation. Um, you know, uh, Andrew Hippolitz here from Collier's Engineering, um, formerly of Mazer Consulting, who has done work with the township for several years on various issues that predate my employment. Um, I also have some experience with the firm in prior communities, and I think I may have actually worked with Mr. Hippolyte in another town on a project um, several years ago, if I remember correctly, um, which I didn't recall until relatively recently. But, you know, their firm comes with great experience. They have an excellent background in this very specific area, a portfolio of which is online. Uh, Mr. Hippolyte was referred to me by one of the partners in the firm who has done this type of work several times uh, throughout New Jersey. So, you know, I'm not going to attempt to, um, you know, cite his report. I'll allow him to do that himself as he is the expert in this field. So with that, I'm just going to tur turn it over to Mr. Hippolyte to uh, provide some commentary about his analysis. He did visit the site and what he would recommend going forward and maybe address some of the comments that were made earlier. So I know you were on the meeting uh, during the public comment session along with some of the comments, some of the discussion that I had with you regarding some of the other comments. So with that, I'll just turn it over to you. I'll let you introduce yourself to the committee and discuss uh, your analysis. Hey, thanks, Jerry. I thank the mayor and council for the opportunity to come tonight. Jerry did contact me to look at the Hart Park, which I did visit the Hart Park and so many other parks in town. A little background, I am a, a partner at Collier's Engineering, formerly Mazer. I am in charge of municipal services nationwide. I am also in charge of recreation services, which is regular parks, passive, active, turf fields, natural grass fields, all recreation services nationwide. So all those projects fold in under my review. A little background on just recreation and fields. I've been designing both natural grass and turf fields since 1990. I have a lot of experience in it. So there's been significant ups and downs in the industry on both grass and turf fields for 30 years. It's changed significantly since I first started it. When you look at this issue and you're, you're, you're dealing with this issue now in 2021, a lot of your neighbors dealt with it four or five years ago or 10 years ago. It, it's always a dividing issue. There's people who want grass, there's people who want turf, there's people who want a mix. What I will tell you is in my experience, 
The communities surrounding you and the ones in Northern Jersey have found that a mix of both works really well. Um, New Jersey's Northern communities are very densely populated. They're more leaning towards urban. They are suburban, but leaning towards urban with their fields. Field use is very stressed because 30 years ago, we had some soccer, no lacrosse, baseball, and softball, and then football had specific fields. 30 years later, we have multiple levels of boys and girls soccer, multiple levels of boys and girls lacrosse. Softball is in full swing and a big time sport. Baseball does decline and go up and down. We saw baseball and you have other, other men's sports. You have corporate uses that want your fields and you want to use your fields just for passive stuff. So the strain on just purely grass fields has shown its wear. And when I walked to Maplewood Fields a couple weeks ago, what I see is that you suffer what every other Northern New Jersey community suffers, which is overuse of all your fields. What does overuse cause? People on the call earlier were saying, well, we'll just come up with a schedule and maintain it better. There's no way to do it. What I will tell you is, is a natural grass field can handle about 20 uses per week. That's practices or games, add them up. If you exceed 20 uses, the actual regular natural grass fiber breaks down. The ground below it compacts and it can't be maintained. If you look at the perfect field, which we'll call a Yankee Stadium, people are Yankee fans, right? Look at Yankee Stadium, it's beautiful. They play on it seven times a week at most. They don't even practice on it. When they do, they practice on mats. And that's because the grass can't handle the wear it has. Your fields are seeing 40, 50 uses per field per week. There's no way to maintain it. If you were to maintain it, it would cost probably fifty grand per nat $50,000 per natural grass field. And it would require up to six to eight weeks of shutdown and resodding every single year. So what happens is, I think that one lady said it very eloquently, you get holes that cause ACL tears and you get dips that hold water and the fields aren't playable half the time because it's not possible. And, and what the communities around you have done, to, two examples are very close because I've done them as both Summit and New Providence, they went to hybrids. Some natural grass fields, some turf fields, they looked at where their heavy use play was for soccer, lacrosse, baseball and softball and said, if we have lights there, let's put turf there because we can use it up. And let's take our other parks that are natural grass and we'll invest some money in those. We'll be able to rest them six to eight weeks a year. We'll be able to plant the turf field more. And you get, you get a kind of a, a mix of both. I did hear from a number of people about heat. 30 years ago, when I first started doing turf fields, heat was a big problem. Fields were getting to literally 80, 90, 100 degrees or higher in the 120 degrees in summer months. Every turf manufacturer has come up with a product now to put on the field. Some people call it cool play, some people call it other, other products, but the product lowers the temperature of the field 15 plus degrees in any hot weather. So there's a way to deal with that. The other thing that I, I did here, which we should probably address is, you know, what's the environmental impact of a turf field? So what I will tell you is, and there's multiple health departments that have looked at this, New Jersey and New York have done it, Connecticut, Washington State, Maryland, Massachusetts, all the major universities, Rutgers, Penn State, Navy, Air Force, Army, they've all looked at it. There's nothing in the turf field that you don't use in your house right now. You don't have in your clothes, on your body. It's nothing. The product has been tested by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. It's an inert product that doesn't break down. So if you took a turf field and threw it in the lake, it would still be a turf field 50 years from now. It does not break down. Water doesn't break down. You have to add like an acid to it or an additive to break it down like you would any other product. So it's not, it's not a risk to the environment. There are, there are benefits to turf and there are benefits to grass. So when you look at grass, obviously it's natural. You rub your feet in it, you walk on it. It's cool. It looks good, but it requires a lot of water, requires a lot of maintenance, requires a lot of money for maintenance. It attracts geese. Geese are a huge problem in Northern New Jersey. A dozen geese on a field a week is as much feces as a septic system in a house provides an entire year to your groundwater. So geese is a northern New Jersey massive problem right now. We have no way to deal with it. It's not, it's not the right thing to go out and just take geese and cull them and move in the community. It becomes a very controversial thing. And the other problem you have with natural fields is fertilizers, pesticides, even if they're organic or natural, that is based on anim animal feces and it's mixed in and used. So those fields have to be rested and it poses a hazard to humans. It has to be shut down for some period of time. If you're using the chemical fertilizers and pesticides, I mean, that has a whole list of things it does. 
Your turf field doesn't require any fertilization, doesn't require any pesticides, requires no water. Um, it doesn't break down. And if it will, we'll use the 10 year item that some people reference. After a 10 year period, turf field used to be deemed as being no good anymore. That product's been improved now. Most of the warranties expire at 10 years, but the fields are lasting well into 20 years with, with minor replacement. And after the 20 year period, it's really interesting. We've come up with ways to recycle the entire field. So they recycle the entire field and reuse about 80% of it in the new field you're going to create. So it's even recyclable now. So the synthetic turf fields, granted, I will tell you as a, as a baseball purist, I wouldn't want every field to be synthetic turf, but also as a dad who coached a, a child in Morristown and a daughter playing softball and a son playing baseball, having a synthetic turf field helps get through those rainy days and those games where we need to get games in. And having a natural grass field is maybe great for that big all-star game where you want to have the perfectly mowed field that looks great. So a lot of pluses and minus to both fields. I can talk about all of them if you have questions, but just to go over the Hart Park specifically. So I looked at the Hart Park, at evident overuse, inconsistent surface when you walk it, drainage is a problem. The surface below the grass is compacted, so 100% of the rainwater is probably running off at this point. The infield is overspraying into the outfield. So you're getting migration of clay into grass and that's killing that area and causing a hump. You have at least three or four fields striped on there. You have your softball, possibly little league baseball, 77, 99 soccer, and then a larger soccer field in there. All that leads up to, I can't keep a grass field looking any good without shutting it down for six to eight weeks a year. And then if I add night games in it, my uses go from 20 to 30 uses per week to Sometimes in the summertime, 60 uses a week, you can't maintain it. That park, compared to the park that's not far right across the street, we have other softball fields and other things. They're close, but this park has lights. So the heart has lights. So you can now strike the field for 77 soccer, 99 soccer, full-size soccer, possible across if you wanted it, softball and little league baseball. So you have all these uses that can use it day and night. I mean, obviously I don't control your time frame and you have residents that live close, but you have a lot of uses you can get in one park. And that park is surrounded by the apartments, a green area in front, you have basketball courts, I think you have tennis courts there, and you have green that's around the sides. The other big benefit of a synthetic turf field, specifically where the hard park is, right now, and I haven't seen it in the rain, but I can tell by the way the drain is set up, you're getting a lot of runoff from that park. There's, you're getting no infiltration through that grass because it's very compacted. The synthetic turf field is going to allow for 100% recharge of groundwater into the, into the ground, which is good. It also allow for, if you wanted to, you could create some type of cistern of that water and reuse that water to water the rest of the park. So you can make it a very environmentally sensitive park. There was some questions on different types of infill in the package I gave you. It talks about different infills. Here's all I'll tell you. The rubber infill is rubber. We all have rubber in our houses. If you're that concerned about it, there are other infills you can use, like coconut husk and different things, but those other infills are four times the cost of the rubber. So whatever your budget is, you have to increase it to that infill because it's much more expensive. The other thing those infills do, not that I'm against them, but you need to know the downside is they require more maintenance. The rubber doesn't break down, the rubber doesn't blow away. The kids take a little bit away on, and like, like when I walked out there with my pants on a synthetic turf field with cuffs on it, a little rubber will get caught in the cuffs. Some will go away, but on a, in, in the use of a synthetic turf field over 10 years, very rarely do you even re refurbish or remove rubber because there's nothing there. It moves around a little bit, and a little bit taken away is really not an issue. It doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody. Um, I know there is always concerns about the actual rubber. And is, does it pose a health concern to children or parents? Again, almost every state in, New in the United States has studied this rubber. It does not, if it did, we gotta like reevaluate our houses because this rubber is in our houses every day. It's in everything we do. So um, in general, my recommendation, looking at the Hart Park, looking at your other parks around town that I walked around with your recreation director, the Hart Park is a very good park for turf. If you're gonna put turf somewhere, that's your multi-use park with lights. That's your park, you can maximize multiple sports, boys, girls, you can even have high schools play there. You have a lot you can do there. It's still surrounded by green space and you could do things as part of that construction to be really environmentally conscious, like full recharge of water, possible storage and reuse of water on site. And again, this is a big issue for all of New Jersey communities, especially in Northern Jersey. 
it removes any geese problem you have there. And geese species are a major problem facing New Jersey right now. The rest of the package I gave you talks about uh, the health farms have looked at these items. It also talks about um, the types of turf, the types of infill. It talks about a little bit about the science of it. I will tell you that there's been numerous studies done. Penn State probably did the biggest one about injuries on natural grass versus turf. It's, it's significantly less on synthetic turf because it's a very good surface. It's not too hard, it's not too soft, and it's consistent. So knee, ankle, and head injuries and neck injuries are way down on synthetic turf. On a, a park like the Hart Park where it's been compacted, I get hit, I fall, hit my neck and my head, my chance of an injury, a spinal injury or concussion is much higher on, on a natural grass field that you can't maintain if you don't use it. So in general, again, based on my experience, the hard parks you place for synthetic turf. Other parks, you then can take your money for maintaining the heart and move it to them to maintain the natural grass in those parks. So that's a very short version because I know it's very late. It's 1030. Um, I can keep going or you can ask me questions. Uh, I'm not going to share it, Nancy. But... Yeah. I do have a question. Thanks. Yeah. Just on the maintenance, you you addressed the maintenance for the natural turf, right? An actual turf as opposed to plastic turf. Um, but you didn't address how what the maintenance is for um, artificial turf on an annual basis, daily basis, weekly basis. It's a really good, it's a really good question. So on, on a synthetic turf field, what we tell our communities to do, we tell them to budget, you know, anywhere from about two thousand to five thousand dollars a year for maintenance. And here's, here's what's in that number. And you don't have to do it all at your choice. Some communities decide that the moms and the dads and kids don't like taking rubber home with them on their clothes, even if it's only a little bit. So that the, that most people will treat their field once a year with a half soap, regular household soap, half water mixture that they broadcast across the field. That removes the static electricity between the rubber pellet and the clothing and the person. So that's, you know, but somewhere, your field's a little bigger. It's like 2,000, 200,000 square feet. So it'd be about 1,800 bucks. So that would be into that number. The remainder is just your DPW and your DPW's time. So you have to put a number on your time. You'll receive a brushing machine with the turf when you buy it. They put it on, probably you already have probably your own John Deere cart. You pull it around and once a month, maybe once every 18, I'm not, once a month or once every eight weeks, you will brush the field. So it's just your DPW's time to do that. The only other dollar cost, if there was one, is if a camp is out there, let's say lacrosse holds a camp, and they do a, a cut and turn movement, and, and 150 players do the same movement and stop at the same spot, that little spot will start to wear out rubber. So a DPW, um, a worker or a coach will have to come out and kind of rake rubber back into that. And again, it's just an hourly cost. So realistically, a field your size, $2,500 for maintenance a year is probably enough. I don't know your DPW salaries, hourly wages, but it's very, it's very minimal. So you mentioned that um, the cooling and that it's cooler. So if we're starting at a starting point of like 140 degrees on the heat, right? Generated by, which is what's been documented, generated by these fields. So a 15 to 20 degree difference is still well over 100 degrees. So, me just so can I, I just want to add, finish your question. Sorry. Um, they, the, what I've heard is that in order to maintain that cool aspect, even to, to the extent that it's cooler than it could be, um, it has to be watered with like 12,000 gallons of water every three days in order to do that. So is that something that is true or not in your experience? So it, it, used to be true so back back in the old days when i say the old days back in the 90s nobody knew how to deal with the fields they dug their fields what had happened was there was a study done by i think the university of arizona in the 90s that said hey we have a football team that's practicing in the arizona desert and the field's 140 degrees it's 120 out and the turf raised at 20 degrees what i will tell you based on that those studies back then they found that a synthetic turf field in the old days would reflect about 10 to, 10 to 15 degrees more than the outside temperature. So I know a lot of people do throw out the 140 degree temperature. It's not the way it works. And in Northern New Jersey, you would take the outside temperature, say it was 85 degrees. If you're a midsummer day, 85 degrees, a normal synthetic turf field without any treatment for heat would be about 100. 
what the turf industry said was, well, we don't want to have this bad name out there having this hot field. So they came up with a product that's made out of vermiculite, which is just a rock product. They broadcast it in a very, really limited way across the field. And it lowers the temperature back down to the same temperature of the air or within five degrees of the air temperature. So it's not. Is that something that's on the field already? Or is that something that needs to be applied in order to bring the temperature down? It's brought, it's, so first you, when you lay the synthetic turf field on the infill with about two inches of rubber and sand. On top of that is a, what's a, what is about, I don't know, not even an inch, less than an inch of this vermiculite material, which that vermiculite material mixes in with the rubber and sand and lowers the heat. There's no, no watering necessary anymore. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen real quick to get your um, opinion, if I will. So this is a map of land surface temperature for um, this area. Right, the purple and blue, as you can see right here, is um, cooler. And then as it gets red, orange or red, it's hotter, right? Yep. So obviously this is South Mountain Reservation, nice and cool with all the trees. Um, Underhill and Seton Hall artificial turfs are um, obviously hotter right here. As we get hone in on example, that I thought was really interesting. Home Depot that was built a while back um, has a black roof. And you can see that's like the hottest thing on this map. Mm -hmm. um, by contrast, the shopping center where Whole Foods and Target is was um, built with white roof and solar panels. So it's, it's not as hot, obviously. The artificial turf in Union, just down the street from Dehart Park has the, the heat showing and the natural grass currently at Dehart is cooler. So I just, and, and the impact of the heat is not just on the players and on the field, in my uh, estimation, it, it heats up the entire neighborhood, which is very densely populated around here. So I'd just like to get your um, thoughts on that. So all the fields you showed on there in Alma, um, some of my work on those fields don't have any heat treatment on them. So they don't have, they don't have the cool play product on them. If you look at, again, it's a cost factor, but if you look at team Academy in Newark, so team Academy in Newark was very similar. They did their project we did for them. They said, we're both concerned about rubber in our fields and heat. So they used the, the recycled corn husks or broken down corn husks to fill their field in. And that addressed both their concerns and the parents concerned about their children playing rubber and also address the heat at the same time. So if heat is your issue, which you can treat it so you can get it to where it's not an issue, it just costs you money. So yeah. would the trees around the field that are currently existing around the field need to be removed in order to turf plastic turf this? No. You're, 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 the hard park is, is, is a basically a newly fenced in field. So you had a black powder coated fence. It looked in relatively good shape. Um, you would not go outside that. You would come inside the fence, put a, um, we could either do it with concrete or recycled tie. That would be your nailer and the turf would nail it onto that. You would never, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go outside the fence. There's no reason to. And so the existing fence would remain? Yes. Okay, and so does that fence need to be locked when, like, in other words, for the warranty that you mentioned that lasts 10 years, does, does it, I'm assuming it has certain requirements or like my car, if I fix something myself, the warranty may not be valid, right? So if, if the fence is unlocked um, and so unsupervised activity happens there, does that, affect the warranty at all? No, un, 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 unlike a grass field, synthetic turf could have unlimited play. The only thing that affects the warranty is if, if you decide not to maintain it right. And the maintenance, again, is about four or five times a year, your DPW would brush the field with an approved device. When the field's open, the manufacturer of turf trains them how to brush it so they know how to do it. Unless there's malice where a DPW working decides to set the tongues too low, or somebody goes out and tries to damage the field, but you could just call a certified turf repair person to come in and fix it, and your warranty is valid. The only other thing that invalidates your warranty and you can fix it is, let's say, the batter's box is softball. Let's say you go five seasons 
and there's a, a, a batter standing in there and they're scraping their feet and they wore it down to the backing. They wore all the rubber and sand away and now they're just batting on backing. If you decide never to fix it as a community, that's going to avoid the warranty in that area, but you would just call a certified turf repair person in by the company you pick and they would come in and fix it and your warranty is back in full force. The warranty of a turf field is warranty against breakdown or defect in the product, meaning the monofilament fiber, the uh, rubber infill, and the actual backing itself. So the warranty wouldn't cover, say, because the way the field is constructed is um, sort of strips sewn together. So if a clean, it covers that. It covers, it covers yeah. that. right, it would cover that. So if a, and how long does that repair take if somebody catches a cleat or shoe and rips that seam open? So it doesn't work that way. So what would happen is there, nobody's going to catch a cleat and open a seam. So what will happen is, is if usually it is maintenance, maintenance driven, but if a seam starts to open up, you would see it. It shows, it's like a crack in pavement. As soon as you see it starting to open up, you would call the turf company because you'd have the company to put it in and they'd come in and just fix it instantly for you. It takes, you know, a half hour. There's the maintenance of these things is easy. If you, if you know um, Upper Tatlock Field and Summit, so when that field was put in, within like two years of it being put in, there was a problem with the logo, the big S in the middle of the field had a problem. And they, they had a big lacrosse game coming up. They were going to shut the field down. They called us. They said, I would have it fixed in an hour. And we had somebody there was fixed in an hour and the field was open and they had a problem ever again. It's not, you know, th those types of repairs, the seams are sewn and glued. So usually a seam failure is very rare, but if there is one, it is, it is warranted and it's easily fixable. And I will tell you, if you look, again, I, I, I do like grass fields, but grass fields, in my opinion, should be locked all the time. The best example is Parsippany's Field, Smith Field. Smithfield has a beautiful turf football field, which is open all the time. It has four or five beautiful baseball fields that are locked all the time with signs on them because they don't want to wear them out and they're beautiful, but you have to lock them because people overuse them and they destroy them. Turf fields, you can play as much play everybody, run, play, have a good time. You can use it unlimited. And if you put the heat treatment on it, it's going to be soup kids. So people are going to walk out with bare feet, literally. You know, we're doing a project now for oratory school and summit their old turf field doesn't have the heat treatment on it. They're going to replace it, put it on there, and the kids will practice in gym class in socks. Mine's not. No shoes. So I don't have anything else right now. Just. Um... I, I, I mean, uh, Jerry has my contact information. If you, anybody has questions when this is over, I know this is like one, you know, 15 minute thing I'm talking. You could, Jerry will give my cell phone number. I have no problem answering questions or meeting you. Like I said, I literally have 30 years experience in grass and in synthetic turf, all the way up to the university level. So would you, would you, so I was a little surprised by the proposal being the entirety of that grass. So when you mentioned there's green space around it, where, where there is so no green space the, around it. The hard park would just be the field. Yeah. The rest, we wouldn't touch the rest of the park. No, but there's really no grass to speak of in the rest of the park. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a path around that field. There's you know existing playground and basketball and tennis, but there's really no other grass. So is it possible to do just the soccer field area and leave the softball field as natural, which is something I played on for 18 years? When I well, here's all I'll tell you. I've done, in 30 years, I've probably done a couple of dozen parks that way. Mm -hmm. and every time I've gone back and taken all the natural stuff out because everybody's like, wait a second. We could play here all the time in the rain. We have to shut down half the park when it rains or we can't play on it because there's snow on it, but we can pile the snow off this. You'll, within two years, you'll take it all out. I did it at field. We did this exact example at Fieldstone School in the borough of Montvale. We left part of it natural, and within two years, they ripped it all out and put it all turf in. The other benefit, and we didn't talk about it, I mean, there's a, a very big accessibility benefit to synthetic turf. So this field is big enough to where you can now have challenger games. People with disabilities, both visual, walking, they can have challenger games because these fields are fully accessible. So your park has good parking. They can get out to the field, and they can hold a challenger softball, baseball games on these fields which is point. so we can for people who have 
uh, special needs they can use the field. Too. That's right. a good point. Thank you. A lot of communities are now putting in synthetic turf softball fields for people with disabilities to play games because they can't. If you're if you're on sticks, if you're in a, in a cart, if you're somebody who needs somebody to push you around, you know, a lot of the communities, Morristown does it um, up at the Morris County Park. Uh, they take both the regular kids playing baseball and softball and they mix those with challenger kids and what a wonder. I mean, I, I take part in every day. What a wonderful day it is. It's amazing. It'll change your life if you do it one day. Does anyone else have any questions uh, for Mr. How do you pronounce your name again, Mr. Hip Hop? Hip Olet. Hip Olet. Awesome. I have a, 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 a just one comment, one question. Uh, you know, there is uh, there is grass around the fence, around the whole park, and then there's there's grass on the other side of the walking path too, and we're not disturbing any of that grass, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I have a question for Mr. Jimes, and it's a little delicate because we have a consultant sitting here. Um, you only brought us one consultant. Are we looking at other consultants too? Um, I was not. I figured, you know, find with a firm I know who we have a relationship with, with here in Maplewood, who has a demonstrated track record, who's one of the best of the best in this field. And I just thought, you know, that process would take more time. So I just figured... Is there a rush? Because one hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars is something I think would benefit the township for other estimates. No offense to Mr. Hiplet. I think with the time frame on what we were looking to do, you know, losing three, four weeks with proposals and reviews, um, I, it's my own opinion, you know, would have gone into some of the time. Well, actually, in speaking with Mr. Hiplet, the time frame you know, would not have warranted that uh, if we wanted to get done with the least disruption to any of the programs. And, you know, obviously I'll be guided by the governing body, but I just felt, you know, being- is, I mean, I'm in favor of moving forward. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, he has a good, the, the firm has a great track record. You know, we know that if we don't get this done now, then we're gonna lose a whole other season. Uh, and that's why we've been focusing on this. So from my perspective, I'm I'm comfortable with moving forward with this consulting, which you've vetted out, we've done work with before, and open to discussion. But that's my opinion, so I'm a yes. Mr. Deluca, did you finish your question? You uh, did you say two things you wanted to say? I did. I'm done. Okay, Mayor, may I go next? I I just have a question for Mr. Hippolyte. Mr. Daffs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hippolyte, thanks for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you mentioned it a little bit, the, the infill alternatives, the, uh, the cork that we heard from earlier in public comment and the coconut husk. Are, are they, I know you addressed the pros and cons in your uh, voluminous report. <laughs> uh, you did advantages of and disadvantages of different infill. Can you talk a little bit about that as it relates to durability and sustainability? I mean, is the cork less durable over the long term uh, than the rubber? Or, or, I mean, what are the pros and cons? So the, uh, the cork and the corn husk, either or, um, they both need updating and replacement and look yearly. So you need to look at that yearly to see where you need more of that product. That product is subject to potentially wind and obviously use, it breaks down. So unlike the rubber, cork will just powderize to a powder. So will the corn house be powderized to a powder. So you would need to budget money yearly to do replacement of that material. It does provide heat treatment all by itself. The rubber needs a heat treatment applied on top of it, even though the heat treatment is vermiculite, which is natural, it's just a stone, but that does provide a heat treatment. I will tell you that the places we've done cork or corn husks, I think like Team Academy likes it, but they go out, we have to budget, you know, like 15, 20 grand a year to keep replacing because it keeps breaking down. So that's, that's, you have to wrap your head around that budgetable item and then you also have to wrap your head around the idea that you're going to pay three to four times more for it. Corn husks is probably a little bit easier to get. Cork is a, is a product that is you're, you're cutting down trees to get it and you're chopping them up. So 
there's some environmental people that say we don't want to do that because cork is not that easy to come by anymore, especially when there's like a cork virus out there right now. So it's becoming a problem. So that's raising that price a lot right now. The corn husk product breaks down way faster than the cork does. And I'm not trying to sway you from using it. I'm just telling you if you're going to use it, you have to, you're going to pay a lot more money for it. Your, one of your advantages to synthetic turf is a couple thousand dollars your maintenance versus 40 to 50. Right. If you add cork or corn husk, you're bringing those costs to be almost not equal, but they're getting closer to each other. Got it. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Limbrick, any questions? Hearing none. Um, frozen. <laughs> he is frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> he is frozen. Frozen. Um, okay. He's totally frozen. We'll, we'll go back to you. There, he, he's gone now. He just, he'll be back. Okay, Mr. John. So um, tonight, what do you need from us? Uh, do you need uh, a motion for professional services agreement? Um, what's our next steps here? Um, so two things, if you wanted to move forward, one would be a professional service agreement. Um, this falls under the area of professional service. Uh, so you would authorize me and, and the township attorney to prepare a PSA for the next meeting. Um, and then two would be if you wanted to move forward to authorize myself, the CFO and the bond council to prepare a bond ordinance um, based on the estimate and the proposal. Where okay. would this, where would this 139 grand come from? The soft cost in the bond ordinance. Mm, perfect. And is the 1.8 million like exactly how much it is, or should we be bonding for more? And you know, you don't need any more than that. Oh well, that's good. So I I do have a few comments <laughs> because before we move forward, if I'm allowed, I know Mr. Lembrick just joined us again, so maybe I'll I'll yield the floor to him first. Thank you, Mr. Lembrick. Uh, welcome back. We were. Uh... So we're going to yield the floor to you for any questions or comments. No, it's okay. I'll, I, I, I'm just got back on. So while I regroup, why, why doesn't Ms. Adams go? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, if I, before we, you know, this is not a minor um, project we're talking about. And um, I remember when this issue came up back in 2008 and I wasn't on the township committee, obviously, and I was working down in Red Bank, so I wasn't paying that much attention, but I did a little research to figure out how I would vote on the referendum and I voted against the turf for a lot of reasons. So some of the five kids I raised here grew up playing sports in our parks for recreation, cougars, travel, baseball, high school. And it's important to remember, I think, that not all kids play athletics, but need open space and green space to play freely. I never really thought that the fields were in bad shape, even when I was playing on them. Um, one thing I do remember is that prep day before baseball season, or even when my son was playing cougar soccer, the kid had to bring, each kid had to bring a parent or a guardian with them or a family member and, and they'd volunteer and rake out the fields and mow them and help maintain them. And this was sort of a regular practice that I don't think happens anymore, but they also had to stay some time after the games to do some work on it. Sounds like there may need to be some of that um, even with the turf. Um, so the fields were being taken care of by those who were using them. It also helped take the burden off the town and kept the fields in decent state. And by the way, taught the kids lessons in caring for their field and not just having things given to them in a, you know, on a silver platter. Um, the fields didn't have to be perfect. And in fact, I personally think that kids become better athletes, better players, if everything is not perfect for them, but that's another conversation. Um, I have major concerns with us bonding $1.8 million for a field with a life expectancy of 10 years. So what happens after that life is over? The township has to bond for another couple million to replace it. If we do this, are we committing future township committees to make this decision again or to spend that money? How much will it cost to return them to return the field to natural turf when that, if they decide not to keep every 10 years bonding $2 million for a plastic turf? 
So that's information that I think would be helpful to think about future costs and future burdens that we're placing on the municipality. Um, another concern of mine um, is that who, who's, what's the actual need and who's is actually benefiting. So of the 25,000 plus residents we have in our community, how many of this would this project for almost $2 million actually benefit? Maybe four to 500 kids participate in Cougar soccer and how many residents are in the Hilton section? Um, so about 30% of Maplewood or about 7,500 people. And we're going to essentially take Dehar Park and, and I'm sorry, but the grass be, that the path cuts between is not something that can, you can play on. So it may be a little bit of grass in the park, but essentially you're taking away all the grass. So I think that's just a silly argument that there's a little bit of grass around. But anyway, we're not benefiting, we're benefiting taking away a park, a green space for 7,500 neighbors just in the Hilton neighborhood, never mind College Hill, to benefit people who play soccer. So the park can currently be used 12 months a year, but we're gonna take away all, all of the grass that's usable for something that's pretty much spring, maybe summer if it's not too hot and fall for soccer. So to me, that doesn't seem equitable and it doesn't seem fair. If this was, if this was just an athletic field, you know, somebody somewhere decided to put up a sign that said Dehart Athletic Complex or Sports Complex, that doesn't make it one. It's a public park and it's an important and vital green space to the most densely populated section of our town to make it plastic and fenced in just so we're not embarrassed by, by like neighboring fields and we wanna, as somebody said tonight, keep up with the Joneses seems irrational to me and unfair and not thought out. So, you know, I just, I think that we we're pretending that we're gonna put in this plastic turf and everything's gonna be hunky dory and all the kids can play all the time. like. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not the not reality. And I just think we're, we're moving too fast on this to just try to get it done. And we're not being fair to the community and paying attention to it. And the social justice aspect that somebody brought up also is really important to pay attention to. We do that with almost every issue we talk about in this town. So this public park with a community center is not just a sports field. If this were, like I said, a discussion on just a sports field, I'd probably still be opposed to it for the cost, for environmental reasons. But this other part of it, just taking this natural grass completely away from a part of our town that is mostly paved in streets, covered with houses and small plots so people need to go to the park to kick a ball around or to just lay down on the park. And I, I just feel like it's, it's really, we have so many other things. If we're talking environmental, we could be bond, I'd be all in favor of bonding some money to put our electric infrastructure, electric vehicle charging station infrastructure and, and for our proposed you know, transition to electric vehicles for the township, that would be awesome. But we, 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 I just think this is so short-sighted and I don't even understand what the rush is either. So. That's that's my comments on it. I'm I'm really sad that this is getting pushed so fast. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, Mr. Limbrick. So I I, and I I apologize. I briefly dropped off before my uh, my my Zoom dropped. So what is it we're what is it if anything we're actually being asked to vote on this evening? Can someone clarify? One hundred thirty nine thousand dollars for the consulting firm, and then. Uh, allowing bond council to prepare $1.8 million. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Mr. Johns, would you like to answer the question? Um, so there would be two authorizations that we would be seeking. The first one would be for a bond ordinance based on the estimate in the proposal. And the second one would be authorization to establish a professional service agreement with Collier's Engineering, the cost of which the 139,000 would be paid out of the soft cost of the bond. 
Okay, so so we would be basically giving a green light tonight. I mean, presumably we can vote on a one point eight million dollar bond ordinance tonight. That has to be noticed and right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It'd be a public hearing, a first reading, and a public hearing, just like any other ordinance. Yeah, stop. Right. That. Okay. So, so so really, what what we're what we're going tonight is is to authorize moving forward with with bond council to to start the process so basically green light to to move forward towards that end correct okay i'm I, i'm in favor of that thank you mr limbrick um all right here for Ms. Abs, here for mr limbrick uh, mr davis do you have any final words before we take a vote I'm ready to move forward. All right. Mr. DeLuca? Good. All right. Um, I'll make a motion that we move forward with a professional service agreement slash preparing a bond ordinance for turfing to Hartfield. Is, is there a second? I'll second. All right. Ms. Fritz, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? No. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Yes. Mr. Lembrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes. Passes, Mayor, four to one. Thank you, Ms. Fritzen. All right, that concludes our discussion items for this evening. We'll now move on to the consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion um, for one through uh, 16 and set 18 on the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I, I think it's actually one through 11, 13 through 16 and number 18. So I, I think Mr. Dath has already moved number 12 earlier as part of the budget. And I think Mr. Jimes asked us to remove number 17. Correct. Well, was that catch, Mr. Uh, numbers 1 through 11, numbers 13 through 16, and number 18 on the consent agenda. That's resolutions 176 through 184, 186, 187, 189 through 193, and the closed session minutes or, or lack of closed session minutes uh, from June 1. Is there a second? Second. All right, Ms. Fritzen, please call the roll. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Daffis? Yes. Mr. DeLuca? Uh, yes, except for item number two, resolution 177-21, which I'm recusing myself because it has to do with Lexington Avenue. Don't note it. Mr. Lambrick? Yes. Mayor McGee? Yes, thank you, Ms. Fritzen. We're now on agenda item number 18, which is a public comment on any subject matter. Mr. Wall. Good evening again, Mayor and Township Committee. We will now begin the second public comment portion of the meeting. If any meeting attendee would like to address the Township Committee on any subject matter, please use the raise your hand function. We will convert you over to a panelist and allow you three minutes to speak. Would anybody like to address the Township Committee? Okay, Mayor, first up, um, Heather Soslovsky, you have three minutes. Hi, everybody. I, I have a number of questions and comments. Um, first, I'd like to know if Mr. Hippolyte's uh, quote unquote voluminous report will be released to the public. I'm a little concerned living in the area and also separately as the chair of the RAC um, with how little information has been provided to the public. Um, this seems to be something that gets added to the agenda under vague terms without any real knowledge of the neighborhood here as to what's going on. I support turf in general um, because of my time on the RAC. We've had serious issues with fields. I just don't think that the way that this is happening is happening in a way that is inclusive of our community. I certainly don't think it meets, up, meets the standards and the ideas behind OSTF. Um, normally, we're required to demonstrate objective, broad-based community support 
to avoid funding pet projects and those proposed for political gain. Um, previously, just to get a $50,000 consultant on a project, we had to have meetings and data. Um, the RAC was not consulted on this and I'm not speaking on behalf of the RAC, but my experience on the RAC tells me that our community generally will rally behind public sentiment when they feel heard. And I think what's happening right now is you're learning that much of the community does not feel heard. And I am telling you that when we talked about basketball courts, we went door to door to make sure that the neighbors knew what was going on. And so we could hear their feedback and hear whatever their concerns were and hopefully incorporate that information I, I think Mr. DeLuca previously raised on a different project some very creative thinking about expansion of DeHart Park. I think what Ms. Adams showed tonight with that heat index is really concerning. If you look right next to where she pointed out that DeHart is green, it is yellow and red. And that is because this neighborhood has industry. We need green because we have yellow and red. We need green because we have the smallest yards there are and plenty of apartment space. We need green so that our children have safe places to be and to breathe. And so I think you need to hear from the community before you spend $139,000 and certainly before you bond for $1.8 million or more. So I'm asking for as much transparency as you can come up with because it hasn't happened so far. At least that's not how we feel. Um, separately, I heard about the pool tonight. I wanna point out that rec desk does not allow anyone to unenroll, and that's a problem, particularly because there are fees associated with the percent, percentage fees with what's paid. And I also noted your comments about the staff really doing a fabulous job, but that's government employees working on a private pool. Time. Thank you, Ms. Lasky. Does anyone else wanna address the township committee? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I just have one question. This is maybe for, for Mr. Jimes. Um, are, are we planning, you know, would part of the funding, you know, the bond ordinance, would we be using open space trust fund funds? Uh, is that something that we've determined yet? I mean, or is that something that would be open? Because I know there's certain requirements we have to go through, uh, is my understanding, if we wanted to use open space trust fund funds. Uh, for uh, you know, you, you know, to fund the the field at DHART, is that something that you know that we were planning, or is that something that would be discussed at a later time? That wasn't okay. Yeah, because you know, because I, you know, the point, Mrs. Lockwood, is something that you know that we certainly have, you know, in the past, we have you know done certain community surveys and public hearings and such when we were. Uh, potentially looking to explore open space trust fund and grants and things like that. Uh, but yeah, it was my understanding that that actually wasn't something we were exploring here, but uh, thanks for the clarification. Mr. Jimes, I missed your answer. What was your answer? No. 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 We're not going to, well, wait a minute. First of all, I don't think you can make the decision of whether or not we use open space trust fund going forward. I guess the question is, what what is the, I know we may not be using it right now, but there's nothing that would prevent us from deciding in the future to use some of it to pay off the bond, isn't there? Uh, that's correct, yeah. So actually my, my full answer to Mr. Lambrecht was that was not comp contemplated in the planning of this. Certainly you could change that. I think we're going to need to replenish, add about a thousand trees. So maybe we need the open space trust fund money to do that to compensate for the plastic. I mean, as the liaison to the open space trust fund, I could say that this was not contemplated in this year's budget. Uh, there was an allocation, as you all know, from open space toward Maple Crest Park improvements, uh, which includes the, uh, the ongoing uh, spray park project, but not this. That doesn't mean, as Mr. DeLuca said, that it may not in the future, but it does not currently. Thank you, Mr. Daffis. Okay, um, Mr. Waltz, anyone else want to address the Township Committee? Uh, yes, Mayor. Dr. Costley White. 
Oh, great. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Um, Mayor McGeehy and Deputy Mayor Davis, I just wanted to first say I really appreciate your work and energy on the Pride and Juneteenth events lately. I really think that they represent the best of Maplewood. Um, it's been great to see you, Member DeLuca, Member Adams at events in the Hilton neighborhood lately. Uh, and um, I thought, I just wanted to know before I dive into my letter, I wish I had been able to send you all before you voted tonight. Um, I thought Mr. Hippolyta's presentation made me really happy to say that I have never seen a goose into Hart Park. And I'm actually so surprised that he was so concerned about geese after studying the park so closely. So um, so I just wanted to point that out that we don't have to worry too much about geese. Um, so this is what I had wanted to write to you all. Um, dear Township Committee members, I hope you're all well. I'm writing as a concerned Hilton resident in regards to the planned turf at DeHart Park. I want to share that I'm strongly opposed to converting DeHart's only large grass space into a turf field. While I understand the importance of turf for athletes as a mom, I understand that turf fields are harder and hotter for young children to use. I have a two-year-old and four-year-old who use, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. I have a two-year-old and four-year-old who use the park quite often. Um, I, uh, let's see. My son and daughter love running in grass fields. Once the heart becomes turf, the likelihood that they'll burn in skidding or hurt themselves in falls increases. Um, my personal concerns aside, I'm wondering if it may be possible for you all to come to a solution that works for the families who live near the heart park and the sports families who will probably be coming from all over Maplewood um, and using turf. Is it possible for you all to purchase the lot adjacent to the park and expand the green space there? Um, people are really concerned about the turf turf heat, the heat that the turf gives off. So I'm asking you guys to give the park more trees. Um, I'm thinking that if you do expand, if you really do decide to invest in this park, not just for sports families, but for the families who live here in the neighborhood, people who live in this neighborhood, I, I think, you know, it could allow for more space to re even rebuild the only public skate rink in Maplewood that was demolished and removed during the building of the basketball court. Um, not only will this park expansion benefit local Hilton families, as well as the other families from other neighborhoods who come to use the turf fields, I think it will signify your commitment to investing and not shortchanging the residents of one of the most racially and socioeconomically diverse, and I believe the blackest <laughs> section of Maplewood. Um, I really hope that any ordinance passed for turf is also sure to include free and public access to all residents in the ordinance written in it so that it remains so that it remains accessible long past the terms of the current members of the township committee. Um, and if you guys can come up with $1.8 million for soccer people or whoever is coming here to play, I really think that you should be able to come up with more money in rural investment in the area for everyone else who lives here. Um, and please make the public pool public. That's, that's basically it. I hope we get a, a park and a space at the heart that is useful and accessible for all of our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. And it's always a pleasure to see you as well at many of our Juneteenth events, Pride events uh, on Hughes Street. You're always there. So we appreciate your advocacy. I, I see no one else, Mayor. Thank you, Nick. All right. So we are now at our final agenda item, which is uh, agenda 19, a uh, motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Mayor, I, I, I see we have Ms. Crystal who, who raised her hand. So I'm wondering if we may be able to reopen public comment. <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, say no, we, we, we're already moving to adjourn. So we'll have to hear from her next time. But thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Okay.